members, thanks. <laughs> members, the Right Honourable, the Lord Mayor. City of Adelaide Council meeting on Tuesday, the 9th of April 2019. The Lord Mayor is in the chair. This council meeting will be streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the council, including transferring outside of Australia. The red light to my right indicates that the meeting is being filmed and streamed. Council acknowledges that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains and pay respects to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and acknowledge that they're of continuing importance to the Kaurna people living today. We also extend that respect to other uh, Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who may be present today. Council acknowledges the vision of Colonel William Light in determining the site for Adelaide and the design of the city with six squares and surrounding belt of continuous parklands, which is recognised on the National Heritage List as one of the greatest examples of Australia's planning heritage. Please be seated. Members, uh, there are no apologies of leave of or oh, a bit tongue tied tonight or leave of absence tonight. Uh, so we'll go straight to the confirmation of the minutes from the 26th of March. If I could have a mover. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Second to Councillor Sims. Those in favour? Oh, sorry. Is there any changes to the minutes? No. Uh, Councillor Moran. No. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried. Uh, there are no deputations tonight. Just before we go to item six, I would like to acknowledge that it's the last council meeting for two of our directors, um, Beth Davidson Park and Steve Matheson, and I think it would be appropriate, council members, if we show our appreciation of their work over the last few years. <laughs> Further appreciation at dinner tonight. Item six, we have two petitions. Uh, petition number 6.1, Zebra Crossing North East Corner of Whitmore Square. If I could have someone move to accept the petition. Thank you, Councillor Kerra, and a seconder, Councillor Hyde. If we can go to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is accepted, carried, thank you. 6.2, which is a petition for the Zebra Crossing, Sturt Street, Whitmore Square. If I could have uh, a mover to note the petition. Thank you, Councillor Ho, and a seconder, Councillor Sims. Uh, uh, if we could vote, thank you. Those in favour of accepting, those against, that petition is noted. Thank you. That takes us to uh, item seven, which are the recommendations of the committee from the 2nd of April. Uh, so we'll go to recommendation number one, which is the procurement of electricity contract. If I could have someone move. Thank you, Councillor Sims, and a seconder. Councillor Moran. Councillor Sims, did you wish to speak to that? Sum up You can't sum up oh, yet, no, Councillor Sims. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Moran. No, did any members wish to speak to it? Councillor Kerra? Uh, look, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, this is a recommendation, and we did speak about this at uh, committee. Um, however, I think, Lord Mayor, that it uh, it warrants pause to reflect on what it is we're actually approving at this juncture. Um, we are approving our uh, proceeding to a 
to a tender stage for 100% of electricity contracts with the, uh, with the council. Um, there is a substantial cost attached to this proposal, a very substantial cost to our ratepayers. Um, and in my view, uh, there, there, will be, there will be no harm done whatsoever to this process if we, if we uh, are given the opportunity to discuss this at a workshop. Now, the previous committee, uh, the previous committee uh, was, I believe, uh, an introduction uh, for new council members <coughs> on, on something that's very simple. We're talking 20 to 30 million dollars of ratepayers um, dollars. Um, we may decide after a full and frank discussion that 75% of, of the energy contracts uh, should go to renewable industries, uh, perhaps 50%. Because let's keep in mind, uh, the federal government, uh, the federal election is about to happen. We've got two sides. One has got a 25% renewable energy uh, policy at, at a certain date in the future. Another one's got a 50%. We've got a 100% renewable energy uh, proposal here. I think we deserve, as a new council, the opportunity to, to at least discuss this. So I have a, a, an amendment, um, if you will, at number two. Um, I delete number two and replace it with just number two. Yep, uh, and replace it with uh, defers, uh, defers the decision on uh, on the on the tender to a further workshop. So and I seek a second for this. Councillor Hyde. And I'll reserve my right. Uh, Councillor Hyde, did you wish to speak? Um, I have a couple of questions before I speak. Um, uh, I was just wondering if, uh, Michelle, you could walk us through the process, bearing in mind that a lot of this thinking was done by the previous council. Could you walk us through the process as in any, any briefings or previous workshops that the previous council held um, on this topic? Um, through the chair, certainly I can do that. So um, we started this journey, so to speak, probably about 18 months ago, and we recognised that to meet that strategic plan objective, while also finding, um, most importantly, a very cost-effective solution for um, our electricity purchase, we would need to get specialist advice. So we contracted a company through a you know, proc normal procurement process, and they won, they won the um, contract called Energetics, who are energy market specialists. We went through a process that started out looking at what are all the different ways. So we ended up with 20 different options how you could get there, whittled down to 14. Second report came back with those 14. We looked at those in detail, then we went down to three. Um, and then at that time, so it's a very much a staged approach. Um, bring it down, find out what are the risks and the benefits and the opportunities at each stage. Um, and then we um, basically brought three options to council um, last year, um, which uh, based on that advice and also advice from Minta Ellison, who um, we've also contracted um, to look at this work, um, came up with three options. One was um, a PPA, and that's really, I guess, where the industry across Australia is moving, large corporates are moving that way. The other was build, own, operate, our own um, facility, and the third was green power. On the basis of looking at those three options, um, council and committee decided, and this was in April last year, uh, that a PPA would be the most appropriate and cost effective way forward. Number one, given our role under the Local Government Act, uh, but then also cost and then, um, uh, and uh, being able to get renewable um, electricity. We then, went back to council and we had questions about other you know, approaches. Would, would we um, partner with an um, uh, electricity retailer or not? And we provided advice back from Energetics about all the complications and, and the very extreme risks that would bring with it. Um, and we asked council whether they would be happy with us going out to the market to see if the market was actually even interested in this approach. Um, so um, Energetics went to the market for us. Um, out to about seven different companies and the market came back and said, 
actually, yes, we would be interested. So we then brought that back to council in uh, April, probably May by then, um, and said, yes, they are interested. Are you happy with us to go further this way? So then we did, uh, and we provided in April, sorry, and then in August, uh, a more detailed workshop and briefing to um, uh, elected members. And we actually had um, uh, Clay Walks, Walkson, his last name is, um, one of the leading energy expert lawyers from uh, in Australia from Inter Ellison provide advice to council. Since that time, um, I've provided um, some information through emails and um, all of those council reports. So there has been definitely a journey. Uh, we then went out for an expression of interest after council um, agreed with that approach. To the market, we've had 10 uh, proponents come back, who you'll see in last week's paper. Uh, all of those have been um, basically approved to go through this next stage. This next stage is not actually a commitment to further you know, go through the process. Um, and we're keeping um, on advice of energetics and also Minter Ellison, we're keeping our parameters as broad as possible so that we get um, the best value for money. Uh, this would then come back to council once we um, had the tender results in around August for council consideration. What we could do in the meantime is actually meet with council elected members to really uh, work through uh, any questions that they've got around process or, or where we're going. Um, once you get to um, tender, you then go out for a negotiation, maybe three or four of those uh, for a best and final offer. Okay, thank you, Michelle. I'm quite satisfied with that. I'll maintain the seconding of this amendment um, for the purpose of debate, if anyone else wants to speak on this particular topic. But um, thank you, and I take it as whether this amendment gets up or not, um, I would certainly appreciate the opportunity to contribute in that sort of sense as well. Thank you. Just before I go to Councillor Sims, um, Councillor Kerry, did you want to also delete number three, given that doesn't make sense if you're deferring? Oh, um, sure. Yes, that's, thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Look, it's hardly a surprise that um, I'm not supportive of this amendment. Um, I mean, I think the last thing we need is another workshop. Um, we know that having a workshop is often code for not doing a great deal. There's already been a lot of work done on this, um, and it's now ready to uh, go out to tender. We did have an extensive discussion at committee last week. I realised not everybody was there, but there is an opportunity to get that feedback outside of session if, if that's what people want to do. But the idea of sending this off to a workshop, um, I think would be a real step backwards. And I'd encourage councillors that are thinking of indulging this to actually think about the views of the people that they represent, because I feel very sure that ratepayers want to see Adelaide City Council moving towards a 100% renewable electricity. It's something that's been discussed extensively. There's been significant debate within the community around this. We've just come off the back of our hottest ever summer. People want to see us leading in the space of climate change. And um, to try and defer this or kick this down the road would be a really embarrassing step backwards. So I encourage you to vote against this amendment. Members, would anybody else like to speak to the amendment? If not, I'll go back to, oh, sorry, the CEO would like to make a comment. Three, Lord Mayor, I just need to clarify, we are talking about a 10 year contract. Um, we're talking about a contract that is required to be signed by the 1st of January. Um, and so um, there is a, a degree of time sensitivity with this in that should we defer to a workshop, um, we would need to do that promptly as in the next workshop so that we can bring it back to the next council meeting. Uh, otherwise, we're going to put tension on that period in which we need to negotiate and, and get a contract signed. If we do not sign a contract, then we need to look at alternatives by the 1st of January. So just to be aware from a process point of view, um, it can be achieved, but it will put some pressure on the next process from here on in. Thanks. Thank you, CEO. Councillor Kerry, did you wish to sum up? Yeah, thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, I, look, I do take issue with some of the uh, statements, some of the sort of fait accompli statements made about this. Um, we have not had extensive discussions about this. Uh, there, there has been work uh, by previous councils. That's not in question. And there's no reason that we, as a new council, 
cannot build on the work of previous councils, particularly when it comes to 20, 30, upwards $30 million of rate payers' money. I'm glad Councillor Sims raised the issue of what it is that our rate payers expect. I am not comfortable with the idea that our rate payers expect us to commit to $30 million on a 100% uh, a renewable energy scheme where a new council has no chance whatsoever to discuss the finer points of that. There were very serious and important uh, aspects raised by the Deputy Lord Mayor at the last committee meeting. They're about uh, the creep of technology and whether we have uh, a, a process that will capture that creep of technology. Um, there are other serious questions that I'm sure all of us would like to raise. Um, a question for the CEO. Um, you've mentioned time sensitivity, uh, but you've mentioned the date of the 1st of January. That's the 1st of January next year. Is there such, in your mind, a time sensitivity that we are not able to have at least one more workshop about this? Three, Lord Mayor. Look, I don't believe it's fatal to defer to a workshop. Uh, in fact, if council members are not comfortable with the level of information, I will always encourage council to defer to workshops to gather that information. Um, I've been advised today though that we have limited time in which to consider, further consider this process and that it will put some tension. Uh, but I believe it's not fatal and that we can accommodate it. I might just refer to Michelle just to cl clarify that. Thanks Michelle. Oh, through the Lord Mayor. Um, so certainly it could be accommodated. Um, however, my understanding um, is that if we do rush the market, it does, you know, we may not get as competitive or comprehensive pricing as, as we would like. It is a long process, a staged process. Um, so we would want to do this as quickly um, as possible because you have several, you want your contract in place several months before um, the 1st of January. You don't just sort of have it on the 31st of December. Um, if council is wanting to seek a better understanding, we can do other outer session um, um, processes with elected members or one-on-one -on -one members or something in the design room like other projects do um, in, in the meantime as well. Well, thank you. Um, I'm getting the sense that we're being steamrolled on this, to be honest, from administration. Um, I'm hearing the term, I'm hearing the term, we don't want to be rushed to market. Uh, surely the question at the moment is that we're being rushed to begin with. Um, I, 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 I'm terribly sorry, but with the greatest respect, uh, I have not heard anything concrete, anything concrete as to why we ought not to be able to have a deferral for a period of a few weeks to discuss whether this policy is appropriate for a new council and their ratepayers. We're talking about a $30 million commitment, a $30 million commitment of ratepayers' money. This is not easily come by. These people work hard for this money. They've got a federal election, and we know that they delegate, by and large, decisions about energy to the federal government. Both, like I said, we've got a maximum of 50% renewables coming from one side of politics, who are probably gonna win. Um, you know, so, uh, I, 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 Lord Mayor, I would ask uh, members to actually sit back and reflect whether they want, whether they really think that their constituents are best served by a decision committing this much money without even a chance for them to discuss it properly. Thank you. I'll just get a final comment from the CEO. Yeah, through Lord Mayor, just to, it's, it's necessary for me to respond. Um, with respect, I don't believe it's, it's appropriate to say that council administration is steamrolling this project. It has been, it is unfortunate in, indeed that we have a crossover of council member terms, and that is that is just a, a fact we have to deal with. This matter has been dealt with over a period of nearly two years. You are continuing to debate I, the issue and Through Lord Mayor, I don't believe I'm debating. I'm not entering the debate at all. I'm just clarifying the situation, and that is the administration has not steamrolled this. It has been a period of two years over two councils. I just need to make that point. Thank you. Members, if I can go to the vote. Those in favour of the amendment? Those against?
Council, the division has been called on the amendment. Those in favour of the amendment, please rise and remain standing until all names have been called. Councillor Moran, Councillor Abraham today, Councillor Ho, Councillor Kerr, and Councillor Hyde. Okay, so that. So that's lost. We go back to the substantive, the original. Can we have that up there? Thank you. Did other members want to speak to this? If not, I'll go back to Councillor Sims to sum up. As summed up, I think this is a really exciting opportunity for the council and um, I encourage everybody to get behind it. Members, uh, those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Thank you. Members, that takes us to recommendation two, which is the extension of line of the knot by Bert Flugelman and the eternal question by Richard Tipping. Thank you, Councillor Moran. And a seconder, Councillor Hyde. Councillor Moran, did you wish to speak to it? Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Members, if not, I'll go back to Councillor Moran. Thank you. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Recommendation three was the local government reform ideas. Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd like I'm looking to move. For, sorry. Oh, sorry. Just are you moving the as printed? No, I'm moving it. Alternate motion. So just with a slight um, addition, as is uh, Lord Mayor, with a slight addition at the end in item three, including requesting from the Minister for Local Government an in parallel City of Adelaide Act reform piece specific to the capital city, and I seek a seconder. Councillor Hyde. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Lord Mayor, look, I think this is a very exciting opportunity and one that does come, it doesn't come very often. And I think it's really important to note that it won't be coming back soon either. And I think as our city grows, and we are the capital city of South Australia, I think we need to be able to have a vehicle or a mechanism for reform directly through the minister, uh, separate to that of the whole of local government reform for South Australia. Because if we need to be nimble, we need to be quick, we need to affect legislation changes, we need to potentially look at um, incorporations, organisation, entrepreneurial aspects within the city. We need to affect change sometimes at a legislative level, and that needs to happen. I would like to think through the City of Adelaide Act reform piece that allows us to do that and also allows the Minister the opportunity for us to be able to test bed a lot of concepts only in the city as well. Um, I think this is a real important um, communication piece for us between us and the state government. It could potentially uh, be sitting on the capital city agenda item as well for discussion in the future if this was to be passed because I really think it gives an opportunity for the city to push, lobby and ask for the state government to deliver on outcomes for us that are around city of Adelaide reform versus the whole of the local, uh, local government family. Uh, so look, I'd ask members to support this um, and hopefully we have a positive reform piece that will come out of the government and I'm hoping we can continue to engage with the state government through you, Lord Mayor, uh, if, if and when they develop a position on what this reform piece looks like. Thank you, Deputy Lord, Lord Mayor. Um, Councillor Hyde. No, members? Councillor Martin. I'd like to propose an additional amendment, if I may, Lord Mayor. Um, that is it there. I'm happy with, uh, uh, with the Lord Mayor's amendment, and I seek merely to add those clauses. Yes, uh, thank you, Councillor Sims. Thank you. Um, look, uh, uh, Councillor Abiad's amendment uh, makes great sense. I endorse it entirely. And I think, uh, arguably, the matters that I've included in there also make great sense. Uh, um, first of all, um, I think it's important for us to talk about a cap on campaign spending. Uh, it was a matter of great contention at the committee. But uh, we certainly want to make sure that local government in this city doesn't go the way of other tiers of government when it comes to election campaign spending. Um, 
But we see big spending occasionally in the city. Uh, I'm aware of uh, amounts of forty or $50,000 having been spent on mayoral campaigns. Uh, Councillor Moran tells me that there are cases where much more has been, been spent on previous occasions. Um, but it is not, in my view, a community expectation that whoever has the most money should get a seat on council. And that is the danger of not capping spending. Um, there is also the possibility and the fear that political parties will become involved in local government. And they particularly are not mindful or respectful of uh, the need to cap spending. More particularly, they're not respectful of, of what I think is the legitimacy of community-based candidates contesting elections uh, so that they can advocate on behalf of their own particular communities about issues that concern their communities. And look, you know, I do believe that it is possible that at the next election, we will see both the Liberal Party formally contesting the election, the Labour Party formally contesting the election, and who knows, we may even have representatives of the Shooters Party or One Nation or others, uh, and a cap is an excellent way of ensuring we don't end in, into that, uh, that arms race of election spending. Now, uh, the other uh, matter, the second part of the amendment, is to ask uh, members here to agree to our putting to the government the need to give um, real meaning to the transparency that's intended by having a publicly accessible register of elected member benefits. The idea of, of this register is that the public can go to the register and see for themselves that there is no possible uh, conflict of interest for a member, for a voting member, uh, with their personal or their business interests. Um, it, it is, uh, under the current rules, quite, quite legal for individuals uh, to simply list their uh, their commercial interests as company XYZ. Um, now, this, of course, is transparent under the current legislation, but uh, the fully transparent story behind company XYZ uh, often requires the payment of high fees to conduct searches of company registers to discover complex shareholding arrangements, related companies, trading names, and director relationships. Um, now, uh, may I have 30 seconds? I'm two seconds. Council? Council? Thank you. Um, uh, now, I know that some people do it voluntarily already, uh, and Lord Mayor, you are a shining example. I know that you declare on your register not only company names, but business names. Councillor Moran declares not only company names, but every goddamn share that she and her husband owns, which is incredibly transparent. So that's the, that's the kind of example that I think the, all local government areas, but this one particularly, because it is the Capital City Council, should be trying to observe. And I ask members to uh, support that, knowing that transparency is the goal. Councillor Sims. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And I do want to thank Councillor Martin for putting this forward. You know, members will recall um, at a committee last week, I, I spoke at length about um, my concern around Adelaide City Council elections becoming an arms race. The, the fear that I have that it is becoming increasingly costly for people to be able to compete at um, an Adelaide City Council level. And, you know, to stand for office in the city shouldn't cost you a housing deposit. It shouldn't cost you tens of thousands of dollars to be able to put yourself forward to represent the community. Ultimately, it should be the strength of your ideas, not the size of your bank balance that gets you a place here in this uh, chamber. And I think that's really critically important. So anything that levels the playing field for all should be considered. And um, I'd really encourage people to back this inclusion. I also really like the idea of improving transparency and ensuring that we have a register of interest that actually looks at uh, the various entities that um, council members may be associated with. Because I think our current system is vulnerable to a you know, Clive Palmer or Donald Trump style character coming in who has a series of hidden interests that the community has no knowledge of. Um, and actually this kind of amendment would ensure that there is that level of transparency. Um, and I think that's really critically important, particularly in the city of Adelaide, where we have lots of interest from vested interests 
um, lots of uh, interest from the community in large and, and people that um, want to uh, advance particular causes um, in the council chamber. Ensuring that there is maximum transparency, I think is really appropriate. So I encourage all councillors to uh, back this. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Uh, Councillor Kerr. Uh, well, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, Look, as, as mentioned in committee, I, I, I am genuinely troubled by the by the spending cap. I think that it is a, you know, I, I think there's a problem with it being just anti-democratic. Um, and I think if you looked at lived experience of what we what we've had in the past election, the previous elections, um, you know, look, I hate the idea of big fat uh, property developers in top hats, where you know, smoking cigars, uh, just buying their way into town hall. But I don't see that that's actually happened. I look around at the chamber, uh, and um, I, I don't see, you know, I, I can't, <laughs> show me, show me the big fat property developer, you know. Um, but <laughs> and and this idea, this idea that a spending cap is going to stop. Uh, is going to stop the intrusion of party politics. Well, hello. Uh, we've had, I, I don't think we've had a, uh, we haven't had a red light to party politics yet, but we've had a green light to party oh, politics. Yeah. We've had a green light to party politics. None of the, none of the absence, none of the absence of the caps, uh, the cap has stopped a, uh, a prominent green politician from getting into council. Okay. So I think we can, we can, we can look at, we can look at our experience and we can make a judgment about this uh, without resort to lofty kind of, Kind of ideas. So, uh, look, I am troubled. Who decides? Who decides when there's going to be a cap on spending? And, and that's the problem that I've got. That decision is open to abuse. And if Councillor Sims wants to talk about level of playing field, well, you know, you're a lot more mobile, Councillor Sims, with respect, Lord Mayor. Councillor Sims is a lot more mobile than Quentin Kernahan was. He couldn't get around the city, but he, if he worked hard and was willing to invest, he was able to spend money on his campaign. Uh, what about the gift of the gab? You know, certain certain people running have got a gift of the gab. Certain people don't. Should we level the playing field there? Are you, are you supposed to, you know, uh, put a put a gag in your mouth while you talk? It it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense as a principle. It doesn't make sense as a principle. And I'm troubled by the idea of it being open to abuse. Um, so I can't support. Thank you, members. Just uh, Councillor Canal. Just a couple of short uh, a couple of comments, and um, again, I agree. Uh, certainly, I don't see too many uh, oversized uh, property developers here. And um, but what, when we think about uh, a cap, when we think about what we're trying to prevent, the simple fact is is that uh, when if you're talking about uh, people who have large bases, and you talk about political parties who have who are community-based uh, types of organisations that have uh, reasonably large infrastructures, of all the people that can circumvent these sorts of rules, it is political parties because they are able to put in infrastructure in place, people in place and all, all sorts of ways that they are going to minimise that exposure. I mean, we already have a limit. We can The limit is that it's $500 and anything above that you to disclose. I mean, and that's about uh, making sure that this is a community-based uh, uh, type of um, you know, forum. And I think uh, uh, those that have the desire uh, will use as other forms to get through. And so therefore, this is not going to prevent any sort of political party wishing, if they wish to get into a, a council politics, um, to actually you know, continue to do that. And I mean, there's transparency, guys. Well, yes, I am for transparency. I mean, uh, when you're here in public office, certainly, um, you know, you do wish to make sure people uh, have all the comfort they need. I just question at what point uh, is that, uh, you know, where do you need to go? And, and uh, I'd, I'd like to understand what does that look like to how far down the, uh, the, the, uh, the chain do we need to then disclose just so we're able to uh, be permitted to stand here in, in council. Councillor Hyde. Uh, thanks, Lord Mayor. Just quickly speaking on something that Councillor Knowles said, um, he's absolutely right. Uh, if we put spending caps in, notwithstanding, and I'll come to the actual dollar figures of what everyone in this chamber spent on their campaign and outside of it, um, it will actually advantage political parties uh, operating in this field more than not, because you're actually precluding anyone else um, who doesn't necessarily have uh, it's more so the people power behind them. You're precluding them from being able to match those sorts of political movements if they enter into this sort of sphere. Um, so I actually think it's counterproductive. Moreover, um, and if I could just put a question to the CEO quickly, I understand political parties aren't allowed to run in local government elections. Is that correct? 
CEO? Three well, my political parties, no, I don't believe so. Individuals um, are. Yes, yes, obviously. So, um, so if we're talking about political parties contesting elections, they actually can't anyway. Um, uh, but despite the fact that it would actually be counterintuitive, um, uh, to put a spending cap, I would actually say, and, and the, the proof is in the pudding here, um, because I did the due diligence of checking out everyone's returns, so I know what all of you spent on your campaigns, um, and I know what everyone who didn't make it into this chamber spent on their campaigns, and the people that spent the most did not make it. So obviously there is not, there is not a direct correlation between money spent and making it um, in the election. So uh, I can't support B. I, of course, would support C, but they're bundled together. Um, uh, so I'd urge you to vote this amendment down. I can actually take it in parts, Councillor. Yes. I would actually just make a comment just of what you said, Councillor Hyde, that I am proof positive that the one with the most money doesn't always win. Um, Councillors, any other comments? I'll go back to Councillor Martin to sum up. Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, uh, uh, to use the Latin, there has been much Bova Sturgis here tonight. The, the simple fact is that uh, we are not talking about caps on uh, individual donations of $500. That's a completely different question. We are talking about the amount of money that is being allowed for individual expenditure on campaigns. At this time, it's not capped. And it is true that political parties can't stand at this moment, but Lord Mayor, you would know that uh, at this time within the Labor Party, there is consideration going on about whether or not candidates should stand. I'm sorry, I actually have no idea what you're talking about oh, okay. in terms of um, well, candidates, and I don't belong to any political party, so I have no insights there. I'm not suggesting that you as a member of the Labor Party would know that, Lord Mayor. I'm simply suggesting that that and is... I'm not a member of the Labor Party, so you are quite correct. That's, that's what I said, yes. Um, uh, so there is a possibility that we will find ourselves in a circumstance where people are outspent. Now, it's just fortuitous, shall we say, that those like Councillor Hyde, who didn't spend a great deal of money, were elected. But in a circumstance where people with large amounts of money, with the capacity to spend them and organise themselves in a way with tickets as well, they may find themselves in to this city council at the expense of others who do not have those same resources. Now, I, I can't see in any way that what I'm proposing is anti-democratic. There is no way in which, as Councillor Kira suggests, it can be manipulated because it would be as a result of our appeal to the minister, who then places legislation before parliament, which then determines what that cap is. It cannot be manipulated. Just in the same way that the law determines that criminals can't stand for uh, this particular office. Criminals are prevented because of the act. Now, no one says that's anti-democratic. Uh, and I can't see how a cap to ensure that it's a level playing field would also be anti-democratic. Lord Mayor, um, I'm uh, getting the impression that this, uh, this kind of uh, level playing field is something my colleagues don't have appetite for. So I would ask, in the interests of the other matter, which has the support of some colleagues, that we do take this in parts uh, and, uh, and vote accordingly. So, members, um, I'm going to take the amendment from Councillor Martin in parts, part B and then part C. Is that, yeah, we'll do that one first. So, uh, members, those in favour of part B, those against, Vision. that is lost. Councillors, a division has been called on the amendment, Part B. Those in favour of the amendment, please rise and remain standing until all names have been called. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Moran, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Martin, Councillor Sims. Thank you, members. I'll now go to Part C. Those in favour of Part C, please raise your hand. And those against, that is carried.
So if there's no further discussion, members of a division. Council division has been called on the amendment part C. Those in favour of the amendment, please rise and remain standing until all names have been called. C or C? C. C. Which is the, sorry, that's in the middle of it. Which is the, that one. Councillor Moran, Councillor Ho, Councillor Kerr, Councillor Hyde, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Martin, Councillor Sims. Thank you, members. Uh, I'll now go, if there's no further discussion, I'll go back to the Deputy Lord Mayor to sum up, members. Deputy Lord Mayor. Summed up. Members, uh, we will now vote on the amendment, the amended motion. Thank you. This one's a complicated one. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Great. Thank you, members. That takes us to recommendation four, which is the Local Government Association Ordinary General Meeting Agenda. If I could have a member please move. It's noted, thank you, Councillor Donovan, and a seconder, Councillor Sims. Councillor Donovan, did you wish to speak to it at all? Councillor Sims, members? If not, Councillor Donovan to sum up. Thank you. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. That takes us to 7.2, which recommendations of the Strategic Planning and Development Policy Committee of the 27th of March, we have three recommendations. Uh, so the first recommendation, planning reform update, which is to note, may I have Councillor Move, please, Councillor Abraham and second, councillors, so thank you, Councillor Sims. Councillor Abraham Zadeh, did you wish to speak to it? Councillor Sims? Members? Councillor Abraham Zadeh to sum up? Sum up. Those in favour? Those against, that's carried. Recommendation two is the planning and design code mechanics. If I could have a mover, please. Councillor Sims and a seconder. Councillor Abrahamsadeh. Councillor Sims, did you wish to speak to it? Councillor Abrahamsadeh. No, members? Councillor Sims? Voting ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Recommendation three, which is phase one planning and design code. If I could have a member move it. Thank you, Councillor Abraham today and a seconder. Councillor Knoll. Councillor Abraham today. Councillor Knoll. Members. Councillor Mutt. Oh, <laughs> Councillor Abraham today. <laughs> Members to the vote. Thank you. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Thank you. That takes us to 8.1 was withdrawn, uh, 8.2, which is the submission to the South Australian Arts Plan. Uh, if I could have a member move it. Thank you, Councillor Martin. And a seconder? Councillor Canole. Councillor Martin, did you wish to speak to it? Just briefly, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I'm uh, pleased to endorse this uh, submission, uh, which contains a surprising pact of local government. Uh, constitutes about one third of the total expenditure on arts and heritage uh, within the total spend in this country. But uh, uh, I, I understand this is a submission to the Marshall government and it's to assist them in drafting an arts policy. But I do note there's only one mention in the paper of the city's uh, UNESCO Creative Music City designation. Uh, and it relates to developing a sustainable management funding model for the local executive committee. And I'm wondering whether the, uh, the administration would, uh, uh, since this is a wish list to the state government, whether it might be prepared to include in the document a reference to this council's previously stated support for the establishment of a constable in the city of Adelaide? Uh, CEO. Um Through Lord Mayor, we can incorporate that if that is the wish of council. Well, look, it's, it is something that's been discussed on numerous occasions in this council. I know that the Lord Mayor personally is uh, in favour of there being a concert hall in the city of Adelaide. It would uh, also be supported by all of the 
uh, artistic performing uh, uh, orchestras, including the Symphony Orchestra, the Adelaide Youth Orchestra, plus visiting uh, orchestras, and to have it located in the city of Adelaide rather than outside of the, uh, the boundaries of the city would be a great shame if it were to happen. Uh, Councillor Martin, if I could suggest perhaps if we add a uh, slight amendment to the recommendation just to allow the CEO to make any um, any, any amendments? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, then perhaps that or minor last, that last uh, paragraph three, um, any minor alterations to reflect feedback from council members received at the meeting, comma, including uh, the um, uh, addition of uh, a reference to council support for the creation of a concert hall in the city of Adelaide. Thank you, Councillor Martin. That would, I think that would greatly assist. Uh, I'll just look to the second of Councillor Knoll. Are you happy with that? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Knoll, did you wish to speak to it, members? No, if not, I'll go back to Councillor Martin to sum up. Oh, uh, if we could. Uh, members, if you're happy with that amendment, those in favour? Those against? That's carried. Thank you, members. Uh, that takes us to the question on notice. Councillor Martin. Um, Lord Mayor, I'm happy to take that as read. Is it possible to ask a, a question of clarification, which is not clear from the response? Uh, you may. Thank you. Um, it, it is clear from the answer that the concept plans which have been included in the proposed budget for the 1920 financial year, that is the 750,000, um, is to go forward in the budget. It, but this document doesn't make clear whether council will get an opportunity to approve it, uh, debate it, or whether it is the endorsement of the budget that will approve the 750000 CEO. Through Lord Mayor, I understand this has already been reported to the previous council. If it is in the budget and it's provided for in the budget, administration will go ahead with the project. That's so approval really of the budget means $750,000 to this project? That is correct. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That takes us then to questions without notice. Councillor Martin, I believe you have a question without notice. Um, is it necessary for me to read that, Lord Mayor? Uh, no, if members have all had a chance to read the question without notice, um, I will ask the CEO to provide an answer. Through Lord Mayor, I only just received this shortly before the council meeting. I am aware. I'm not aware, I should say, of a, a study, overseas study tour being organised by the Property Council of South Australia um, in the coming weeks. However, I do understand that the national body, the Property Council of Australia, has a study tour planned for July in this year. Um, in fact, I'm considering attending um, the national study tour as part of my professional development, and I'll be liaising with the Lord Mayor in due course with regard to that. Um, I have not received any expressions of interest from staff members or elected members to attend the event. Excellent. May I ask a supplementary question? Uh, yes, I'll allow that. Is the CEO concerned about any possible um, accusations of a conflict in taking part in what is a lobby group's study tour, and particularly one which is heartily lobbying this council on a range of issues, including encroachments? Lord Mayor, uh, sorry, CEO. You can be Lord Mayor tonight. <laughs> CEO. Through you, Lord Mayor. I hadn't categorised the the um, the property council as a lobby group. Um, they are a, they are a group that provides good advice. However, having said that, now that it's been raised at council, I'll have an active conversation with the Lord Mayor about it before coming to any decision. They're a lobby group. Fine. They're a lobby group. Thank you. Um, we will go then to motions on notice and um, we'll commence with 11.1, .1, Councillor Martin. Um, Lord Mayor, um, I feel like um, uh, 
most people already know about it, but look briefly for the benefit of uh, new members. Um, if I begin with the statistic that 20, 25,000 Australians die every year from sudden cardiac arrest, South Australia's share of those deaths runs to several thousand every year. Without chest compressions, or sometimes more usefully, an automatic external defibrillator, AEDs as they're known, most victims will die unless they receive treatment within seven to eight minutes. Seven to eight minutes, that's all you've got. And that's often outside the time it takes in this city of Adelaide for an ambulance to be dispatched to the location. Now, uh, the city of Adelaide uh, launched on Valentine's Day 2017 um, a program uh, working with SA Ambulance and the Heart Foundation to install automatic external defibrillators at key locations in public places uh, throughout the city. Um, now, in, uh, in this new AED era, when someone rings triple uh, O to ask for an ambulance, reporting typically that somebody has collapsed, um, they'll be connected with SA Ambulance and SA Ambulance will direct them to the nearest automatic external defibrillator if they regard it as being an important thing to do. And they do. Um, we don't know all of the locations, although I did see some figures recently. Um, they do send uh, people to fetch an AED and to use it on victims who have lost consciousness um, in the expectation that if they've had a sudden cardiac arrest, it may well be the thing that saves their life. Um, now, uh, we've got them in key locations at Rundle Hall, uh, Victoria Square, and then uh, throughout the whole of the city. And these machines are incredibly smart. You only, in fact, we went on a walking tour recently and Councillor uh, Ho opened one of the cabinets of one of the devices and it began talking to him. That's exactly what they do. They explain how you take the device out, how you apply it to the chest and so on. And the machine is so smart that if you haven't had a sudden cardiac arrest, it will tell you that the, uh, uh, the patient has not had a cardiac arrest and to wait for the ambulance. So um, these are really important life-saving devices. I, I hadn't realized until a week or two ago um, that we do not have uh, the necessary funds uh, for the maintenance budget in the coming financial year. Um, and approving this will ensure that the 29 AEDs that the City of Adelaide has out there uh, on the streets of the city can be maintained for the coming year. And this will also ensure that they are maintained in future years. And uh, for the South Ward councillors, this will also mean that there will be AEDs taken out of council buildings, uh, particularly at the library on Hutt Street and at the box factory, and they'll be placed on outside walls so that they'll be available 24 hours a day to those communities. I really ask you to support this. This is a really worthwhile initiative and it is just so cheap. Now that was seconded by Councillor Sims. Did you wish to speak? Councillor Kerrin? Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I think we all want to uh, we all want to be a part of um, you know uh, policies and things that save lives. I'm just wondering, uh, and I'm wondering whether the administration might be able to help here. Um, so it's a question for administration. What, what, why is this not uh, a state government um, uh, policy or object? To what? Why and how is it the state government have not stepped up and provided this? Because we are sort of intruding into uh, public health. And I, I'm just mindful of a, I want a better term, moral hazard, if you will, where we step into what the state government ought to be providing, and then it becomes our responsibility. You end up with a shortfall on a, on a very thorough uh, provision of such a thing. See you. Through you, Lord Mayor. The decision to roll out defibrillators was one that was led by Councillor Martin in the last council. Um, we did so on the basis that uh, we would run a, roll a couple of them out initially, and that has proven to be successful. Um, our community safety plan, I think, Claire, is the public health plan, is the document that we can refer to from a strategic point of view. Um, I do think it's important in the future that the council does have 
a strategic approach to the role, the future rollout and servicing and all the costs associated with defibrillators across the city. But to answer your question, um, without council taking the initiative, I don't believe any other body would. And so council has stepped forward to do so. Um, that is not to say that it is our role fundamentally. Um, it's just an absence of anyone else taking that initiative. Just a follow up question, if I may. Um, CEO, was there consultation at the after the motion or before? Uh, did council engage in consultation with the state government to put to them uh, that we're considering doing this? But what what is it that they see? Is there is their role in providing this uh, health service? CEO, through you, Lord Mayor, there are a number of conversations that did occur. Claire, I think you led this. Could I ask you to respond? Uh, through the Lord Mayor, um, yes, we work clo closely with SA Health in the development of our legislative requirements under the public health plan. Um, and so discussions um, were held um, quite some time ago now. There hasn't been a recent discussion. Um, so that, yeah, we have had discussions in the past. Sorry, when, it, it, when, when, when was that and when was it specifically about these? Uh, um, at prices? the initial um, timing, when uh, back in 2016, when the motion was first mooted. And, and what was the outcome of that discussion? What, the, what did the state the, government indicate? Well, the outcome has been that um, local community need is, is seen as a local government priority. So if um, a council considers community health initiatives such as this, then it would be seen as the remit of, of a local government authority to fund. Okay, well, thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, uh, Claire, for that. Um, I, look, like I said, we all, we're all in favour of devices that save people's lives, but I think it is important that we, uh, we actually take uh, this bull by the horns. If it is a, a health uh, aspect, then the state government should rightly be looking into this, uh, should be in this space. And I think it'd be remiss of us as a council to not actually push this. If this works, um, if this works, we are taking on a significant uh, a piece of the health um, uh, requirement or budget or, you know, mandate away from the state government. So I think we should do this, but we should also, we should also be pushing with the state government that this ought to be something you do. We can provide the figures. So if I can get maybe some kind of uh, agreement from administration that they will, they will look into that, that if that's reasonable, I think it'd be a good idea. Could I have an undertaking for that? Yes, through the Lord Mayor, of course, um, we can t have an undertaking tonight to um, write to, on behalf of the CEO, to write to the um, CEO of SA Health to request um, joint partnership funding or full funding. Thank you. Councillor Connell, did you wish to speak? Just as a quick question again to administration. Um, I mean, it's, it's wonderful uh, to be able to, uh, to put out these sorts of uh, devices, etc. My only concern is that um, built into this is that uh, uh, what, what protection have we uh, uh, provided for for council in case something does go wrong? Because again, it's all the unintended consequences of, of putting out a good intention, but have, uh, have we got uh, some form uh, of protection in case there is an issue for some, whatever it can be, that we are not going to be uh, liable for any, any you know, misadventure or uh, difficulty from that? Did you wish to speak to that, Senior? Claire, I think. Thanks. Um, part of uh, what we've done to make sure the community um, can confidently um, use AEDs is partner with the Heart Foundation and St John's Ambulance to run community training sessions. In terms of um, our liability and insurance, I'd probably need um, some advice from Brett, please. Um, through the Lord Mayor, um, Brett's advice, we would need to take that on notice and um, liaise with our uh, scheme for further advice. Members, Councillor Moran. Um, oh, sorry, I'm um, sorry. I'm, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. All right, just, just on that, um, on the safety aspect um, of it, I was wondering as, as probably it were, you know, what if it's at somebody that didn't have a heart attack, you know, just stop the heart. Um, I spoke to my husband who's an anaesthetist and he said that they've never had any problems with them. They only zap when there's a 
they detect uh, something. Anyway, I don't know, but they are basically foolproof. They've never hurt anybody and they've never malfunctioned. So I don't think we have a problem in that area. Councillor Sims, then Councillor Donald. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I'm a little bit um, perplexed by some of the nitpicking that we seem to be seeing on um, this proposal tonight. I mean, to me, this is actually a really good initiative. It's precisely the kind of thing that council should be doing. We're a capital city committee. Um, our remit is much broader than just rates, roads and rubbish. We have a responsibility to look at um, building healthy communities. And if this saves one life, then it's an investment that is worth making, in my view. I think in terms of risks, there's a far greater risk that someone may suffer a heart attack and um, be seriously injured than there is in terms of council moving into this space. So I really encourage people to back this um, proposal. You know, I have no problem with talking to the state government about potential collaborations that may occur, but I just make the point that if we wait for the state government to step in before we um, take action on these kind of issues, we'll be waiting a very long time. I mean, often waiting for the state government to take action is a bit like waiting for Godot. This is a good initiative. Um, Councillor Martin has led it um, and the council has got behind it and endorsed it. And, you know, I'd call on council to really show a heart to back this motion and um, let's continue to fund it. <laughs> Sorry, Councillor Donald. Just very briefly, um, I think this is a very worthwhile motion and um, on the, the risk question, there is already legislation in place that if, if anyone attempts CPR and there is a, um, any, anything goes wrong, that they are covered, so there's no problem there. Um, and as Councillor Moran said, uh, when you use the defibrillator, it assesses the heartbeat and will only zap when it's appropriate to do so. So those things are already covered by legislation, existing legislation. Um, I think why not ask for funding and, and you know, why not? Never hurts to ask. And by the same token, it's very worthwhile doing this because, of course, this fairly small investment actually significantly contributes to the health um, of our community and provides potentially some evidence to say that this is a worthwhile investment to roll out across the state. So why not do all of these things together? Thank you. Members, if not, I'll go back to Councillor Martin to sum up. Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, um, I, I have no objection to asking the state if they want to be involved in this, but I would have an objection if our continuing to roll out AEDs was uh, somehow halted uh, because the state wouldn't participate. This is an important initiative. It's been taken up by local government all around Australia. And indeed, the example of the city of Adelaide is being taken up by other metropolitan councils and other councils throughout South Australia. Indeed, you read regularly in local newspapers about new defibrillators being set up in centres of towns so that residents can be helped in the event of a sudden cardiac arrest. Now, um, uh, I don't want to quibble about this. It makes enormous sense to me, not only in terms of the humanity of it, but it's completely consistent with our strategic plan that requires that we create a livable city. That's the sort of stuff they measure you on. You know, what you do for your citizens, that affects how the city is rated internationally as a world-class city. That's what drives business, that's what drives population. These are important measures. Now, I understand Councillor Kira is um, concerned that um, it's important to understand what previous councils have done, but may I just tell him I, I was exactly the same when I came in this place, and uh, I think it was Councillor Moran who suggested to me if I really thought it was that important to re-litigate every decision, read all the reports and the papers first, they're all freely available, and then you can actually make an informed observation and comment. I think that's the way to go. And when I adopted that, let me tell you, there was much less pain in this place. So this has been through an enormous process. It has been litigated by the previous council. It's been discussed with the council. It's been discussed with government. It's been discussed with the ambulance service. Uh, it has been thoroughly traversed backwards and forwards. I just urge you to support this. Uh, we, we are actually doing something really positive for the people who live, work and visit this city. Members, those in favour? Those against? That's carried. Uh, it takes us to 11.2, Councillor Martin. Yes, uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, uh, 
I require a second. Second. So, Councillor Sims, thank you. Um, look, before I uh, begin, may I just ask two questions of the administration? Yes, you may. Um, have there been discussions with aviation authorities about providing the helipad? See ya. Can you just repeat that? Have there been discussions with aviation authorities, discussions of any nature with aviation authorities about reviving the helipad? Three little men, not that I'm aware of. No. Um, and the motion of council, our formal position determined on January 30th, 2018, was that, and I quote, council does not take any, any further action regarding the development of a commercial helipad in the city of Adelaide at this time. Um, what does it take to overturn that? Through you, Lord Mayor, I'd need to review the motion of council. Um, I haven't seen that tonight. Um, if that is a motion that council wants to work against, it would need a rescission motion. Okay, and we haven't got one of those. Okay, look, Lord Mayor, uh, this motion is to provide uh, reassurance to our ratepayers. Um, uh, a columnist in the advertiser wrote that this is back on the agenda. Uh, it's been well reported. And I note that uh, even in the local messenger, and I don't know why, Lord Mayor, they have your photo there next to Kelly Pat been relaunched. Um, it is cool. Sorry. I would assume because I'm the Lord Mayor. I guess so. I guess so. Uh, I think it seemed to imply that there was some sort of participation in it, and uh, at least some of our residents mistook that. Um, and so this motion is about providing some comfort to them. Uh, because I don't know whether uh, uh, this, uh, members of this council realise, but uh, we had the most hideous experience with this on the last occasion. Um, uh, uh, Councillor Abia initially put up this proposal um, and it went through thousands and thousands of pages of reports, thousands and thousands of comments, uh, a great deal of cost, and uh, the report concluded uh, uh, with a uh, consultant saying that the City of Adelaide, uh, Adelaide stuffed it from start to finish because we didn't have the skills to do it. Uh, and this was underlined by a, a, a council consultation process, which as you remember was hopelessly flawed because uh, someone uh, was offering free helicopter rides um, to people who uh, filled out our Your Say public consultation page saying that they supported the helipad. And then we had, as you remember, a near uh, a miss where civil aviation authorities detected a helicopter taking off from what was to be the proposed site uh, and uh, had to divert a passenger plane that may well have been in the flight path. So people are pretty upset still about that process, but not least because it was to have been on parklands and it only emerged in the in the wash up that there were to be, if it was to be uh, uh, approved, hundreds of trees, or certainly 50 or 60 of them as I recall, uh, uh, chopped down, fences erected, and it would have required parklands to have been closed off uh, to people so that the helicopters could land in and out of the place. Um, Worse than that, we had residents who were concerned about the noise that was going to happen as well over uh, the city and over their homes. Um, so uh, while I'm not opposed to a helipad, I certainly am strongly against one in the parklands and ratepayers, particularly in North Adelaide, have made it very clear to me that this kind of talk uh, unsettles them uh, and therefore they would like some reassurance from council that we are not going to resurrect the Hilly Pad and Parklands. Councillor Sims. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm very pleased to uh, support this motion from Councillor Martin. I must admit when I uh, read the um, opinion piece in the advertiser uh, by David Pemberthy where this was uh, relaunched or um, uh, mooted, uh, a chill went down my spine um, because um, like Councillor Martin, I know just how fraught this has been. I wasn't on council um, when uh, this was discussed previously, but I did follow the fiasco um, quite closely and spoke to a number of residents who are very, very concerned um, around this proposal. 
You know, the parklands belong to all South Australians and we shouldn't be rolling out the red carpet for the big end of town on our public land. When you talk to residents in the city, I can assure you that they don't want to see the parklands being used for joy rides for the mega rich. And that's what this is about, actually. A helipad on the parklands, helicopters, uh, you know, flying across the parklands over what should be, you know, the Adelaide parklands should be a no-fly zone for this council. Um, and uh, I think it's really appalling to see that this idea is back on the agenda again. If we want to have a helipad in the city, I have no issue with having a helipad in the city in general, but don't put it on the parklands. Put it on top of the Adelaide, Adelaide Casino, um, but don't stick it on uh, the parklands um, with all of the impact on public land that uh, comes with that. You know, when I was asked about um, this by the advertiser a few weeks ago, I said that it was a political cold sore for the council, um, and it is because just when we think that the issue is gone, it comes back again. And if this is allowed to fester, it will create ongoing embarrassment for this council. Really what we need to do is put an end to it tonight. And that's why I encourage you to support Councillor Martin's motion so that there is no doubt in the mind of the community that this is something that we will not entertain. And uh, I really encourage you to support this so that we can shut this down. Uh, just before I go to the next speaker, the CEO I wish to make a comment. Through you, Lord Mayor, I just do need to clarify the questioning about the rescission motion. So the latest report to Council was on the 24th of April 2018. Council resolved not to pursue the site located um, adjacent to the river, which is you know west of Morfitt Street, uh, east of Morfitt Street Bridge, no, west, sorry, um, which is Park 27. So to revisit that site would require a rescission motion. But it also, Council also resolved to continue to pursue opportunities to develop, to develop the helipad in the city as part of a recommendation of Council. Having said that, there's been no further action since that time. But just to be clear, Council has a resolution that says that it will continue to consider um, potential opportunities for a helipad in the city. It did, however, say that it would not um, pursue the location of Park 27. So am I clear with that, just so everyone understands? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, then Councillor Hyde, then Councillor Kerry. I think Councillor Martin looks a bit confused. Are you, Councillor? With that, yes. Yeah. So I was going to um, just start off by saying that the actual motion that was moved at the Council did say it does not support the proposed commercial helipad located at Bernathan Park, Park 27, but item 4 of that motion says continues to pursue opportunities for the development of a commercial helipad in the city of Adelaide. Uh, and that was endorsed by the then council. So I would assume, and just correct me if I'm wrong, maybe this might be a question to the administration. So council uh, never put its hand up to say, we have the skills to operate a helipad in the city of Adelaide. There's never been the intention for the city of Adelaide because I moved the initial motion and the initial motion talked about, let's put an expression of interest out to the market for a change and let's see what the market responds back to. So basically we will end up leasing a parcel of land or negotiating with a commercial uh, commercial property owner to assist any proponent that responded to that EOI to be able to deliver on an outcome. That EOI process was concluded and through that process there was an announcement where there was a successful proponent as part of that EOI process. That is correct. That is correct. So what we have today is a successful proponent we have a CASA investigation that we don't know the outcome of yet. Uh, we have a decision of council that says Park 27 isn't an option, which is true. But we also have a council decision of the same motion that says we're still willing to pursue other outcomes. So I am of that mindset. And the reason I'm of that mindset, because this was never a, a, a rich proposition for rich people to get their helicopters out of their homes parked in Burnside and all over Springfield and get to the city because they don't want to ride their cars and their bikes and walk. That's not the intention. The intention of this is to create a tourism attraction. The, attra the intention of this is to connect our city to the regions. We have had an interest from the Barossa Valley, we've had an interest from McLaren Vale. It's been very clear that connecting to the regions is important. This increase, increases one night stays, extra bed night stays in the city of Adelaide. 
All of those things are great opportunities for the city. They're not ones to discount. Uh, and they're things that we need to consider when we're making those decisions. Uh, so for me, and if we look at some of the um, recent studies that were done, there was one done in the US of helicopter noise. For emergency twin engine helicopter, that's an emergency twin engine, one of the big ones that usually will not be used in this sort of space. Determined that a helicopter landing and departing registered a noise between 55 and 85 decibels. You need a noise of 95 decibels to wake someone up. All right? That is what you need. 95 decibels to wake someone up. And the noise level over any one point has to be, is less than one minute. So if it's greater than one minute, sorry, is that correct time? Can I get an extension for one minute? Thank you. Um, so look, at the end, um, if we can provide an opportunity for our city to connect to the regions, to greater tourism attraction, to provide that sense of significance, Councillor Sims reminded us earlier, we're a capital city. We're a capital city in a, in a state. And we need to think as a capital city and have that connectivity to the regions as required. And yes, so what if someone rich uses the helipad and spends money in the city of Adelaide? What is the problem with that? I mean, people pay their taxes. If they can afford to buy a helicopter and use it, if they're coming from interstate or overseas and they wish to use it, then so be it. I have no problems with people using a helipad, investing in the city and spending time with it. And the last thing I want to know, which is really important, currently, at any time, a permit can be obtained to land a helipad pretty much anywhere in the parklands in the city, through the city of Adelaide. You can do that right now, anytime. All right. So this notion of, you know, there's noise coming in, noise coming out, all those problems, this is currently can be occurred under a permit. This is purely a facilitation process and I think it should be encouraged. Thank you. Councillor Hart, then Councillor Kerr. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. At 95 decibels to wake someone, certainly not in North Adelaide, but that is not why I'm speaking in favour of this motion tonight. Um, I would uh, just make the point that uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor is 100% correct on the need for a helipad in the city. Uh, we do need more people coming in. We want them coming in. Uh, we want them spending money and we do want to connect to our regions. Um, uh, but we have seen far too much alienation of our parklands already over the course of South Australia's history. Um, this presents, uh, this helipad going onto the parklands presents um, another one, and I'm opposing this on one of the same principles that this council opposed the Adelaide Oval Hotel, which is that uh, it's commercialisation of the parklands, but not just commercialisations. So we're not talking about a kiosk selling ice creams to visitors. Um, who are going to Rhino Park or something like that. This is exclusive commercialisations of the parklands. Um, this sort of opportunity is not necessarily accessible uh, to the public of South Australia that actually own our parklands. Um, it's only available to a select few, and we've, we've heard it here tonight, and they will probably be uh, wealthy international visitors. And I love wealthy international visitors. Don't get me wrong. They can, they can come into our city and they can pump as much money uh, as they want into our economy. I'm not going to oppose that. But what I will oppose is the alienation um, of our incredibly valuable uh, public spaces in the parklands, as I outlined by Colonel Lyon. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kerra. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, well, I'm not in favour of the uh, alienation of parklands either. I don't want to see a big helipad plonked down in uh, some of our, you know, I don't want to see a helipad in the middle of Rymel Park. I don't want to see, um, I don't know, Fat Cat still appears in Rymel Park, but uh, it's, right, it's been a long time. But if the new Fat Cat, whoever that, you know, the, the next generation of Fat Cat appears in Rymel Park, I don't want them blown away by a helicopter in the middle of their um, performance. Um, the issue I've got, so look, nobody, I don't think anyone here wants our parklands to be besmirched with a, with a gigantic helipad or whatever. The problem I've got with this motion is that it seeks to gainsay uh, the decision of council members ahead of uh, any real deliberative discussions about such a proposal. That, that's the, the trouble I've got with it. I just, I have the sense of political opportunism here. I mean, you know, uh, we had a, we, we, we've just uh, approved a 60 square metre 
a uh, bit of paving with a, with, a, with a permanent light and whatever, on the bank of the Torrens, uh, down in Victoria Drive. I didn't hear really any great opposition to that, except Councillor Martin, to his credit. I heard no opposition from Councillor Sims, no complaint about the aspect of parklands that was uh, endangered by this, this you know, extension of built environments onto that section. So I just have a whiff of, uh, you know, I just can't get away from this idea that this motion may be exploited politically. That's my trouble with it. I mean, we may have a helipad for all the very good reasons raised by the Deputy Lord Mayor. We might have it somewhere and it may be slightly adjacent to a corner of the parklands that is not used. Remember, we have we have got a school that's been built on parklands down the Frome Road. Um, you know, that is bitumen, that is, that is built uh, environments, that is not uh, insignificant. So, my trouble is the gainsaying. Uh, sorry, uh, my, my, my trouble is the gainsaying uh, of council members on. We're, we're not deliberating, deliberating about where this is going to go. I have every confidence this council is not going to approve something that is seriously troubling the park plans. But my concern is is that element of gainsaying of, of our decision on this. So, thank you, Councillor Kerr. Councillor Moran. Uh, yes, look, I, I really did can't agree with uh, Councillor Carer. The motion there is very clear. It is uh, reaffirming our opposition to a bitumen landing strip in the parklands. So I think that perhaps he needs to read that motion again, with all due respect. I fully support um, Councillor Hyde's um, statements. I don't think anybody's against, and I certainly wasn't at the time, um, a helicopter landing somewhere. The Royal Adelaide had one. I can assure you it was quite noisy, but uh, and uh, North Adelaide people don't take any less noise to wake up, and they are your constituents as well, Councillor Hyde. Um, but I think we looked at, um, I urged the last council to look at rooftops, where we see in uh, most major cities. Uh, that noise is then above the street level and tends not to be to be heard. Um, that was unfortunately, and I think this is the reason this motion. All those were brushed aside. They were harder ones. You know, no businesses were on their rooftop. I, I don't think there was really a lot of effort. The parklands, as always, is cheap. It's free. It's easy. The government sees it going begging. So that's what um, was the only. Um, place left standing, and that's where the helipad was put temporarily. It was a disaster there, um, and nearly caused a disaster. So I think with all due respect, nobody's, well, I, I'm not certainly saying no helipads. I have no problem with wealthy people flying around and going to the regions, although we do have an airport fairly close, I must say. Um, but I think we've got to be very careful of our residential areas, our hospitals and so forth, and we need to find somewhere not on the parklands for the helipad. Other cities do it, the hospital did it. Um, we've got the big parade grounds there. I don't know why we can't, I suppose technically that's the parklands, but it is sealed. Um, it is not like the, um, the memorial. I too agreed with uh, Councillor Carer that that was an unseemly amount of paved um, paved parklands, and there were there were was opposition mounted to, and indeed it was moved. But look, I don't think anybody's saying no helicopter, not forever, um, under certain circumstances. But what this motion says is not on the parklands, and I think uh, Councillor Martin is doing this because of the level of unrest, and the Lord Mayor might say her picture is there because she's the Lord Mayor, and of course it was. But it seemed in a lot of my ratepayers' mind that the Lord Mayor was tacitly. Um, saying bring it on and they were thinking park lands. Now when you read the article, Sandy said lot, uh, the old Royal Adelaide Hospital was, was where she'd put it. So I think this just clears up those misconceptions and put everybody's mind at rest. Okay. Members, I might uh, have a few words. Um, first of all, what, and I've got it in front of me, I think you've all got it here, that what David Pemothy said was there's talk that past emblematic failures such as the helipad proposal, an idea embraced by Melbourne City Council in the 50s will be revisited. Um, first of all, I didn't talk to David Pemothy before he wrote said article, and when I was questioned by the media, I did suggest lot 14. So. Um, I thank you for pointing out that my photograph was there, probably because he talked about me in the article, the opinion piece that he had, and I think he has uh, 
obviously wants a helipad in the city at some point. Um, so just to clear that up, it wasn't actually from me. I didn't speak to David and uh, uh, and I just actually put forward my own ideas as where a helipad could go. Um, if there's no other speakers, Councillor Canal. Yeah. Um, just noting from the conversation, I mean, uh, we all have, have obviously a great desire to protect the parklands, etc. But if we have, if we've had no proposals, no. Only, only, only opinion piece, we've just spent ha half an hour discussing yeah. something that hasn't come up anywhere. And we could just as well have said when anybody was would have asked that, but by under, with nothing that comes to us, that nothing that we can talk about. But so we're trying to prevent something that doesn't exist, and also. Guess who's going to approve anything that happens in this space? It's us. So we can discuss it when it actually comes up. And if there's a point to discuss, then do it. I mean, I, I can appreciate we wish to uh, uh, you know, reaffirm uh, our, our desire to protect our parklands and all the rest. But I have to say, going all the way back all, almost to when the city was designed, we have been, you know, people have been putting things on the parklands in all the best intentions, whether it be barracks or hospitals or whatever. And they are uh, in a point by point, uh, uh, you know, uh, where it's decided in the community interest. But like I say, we're trying to protect ourselves from a decision we're going to make that we don't have to because no one's put anything forward other than someone has thought another helicopter would be great to put in this space. And why would you bother? Members, if not, I'll go back to Councillor Martin to sum up. Yeah, look, uh, Councillor Canole, you would bother because this says to the administration, the next time somebody comes to you and says, I've got an idea for a helipad on the parklands, you say, I have a motion from council that says, we will not entertain a helipad on the parklands. That's why you do it. That's what we're doing. We're saying to any prospective helipad operator, we don't want to have one on the parklands. Now, I, I hear Councillor Kira again suggesting that he's feeling somehow exploited by this motion. It is the parklands that are exploited, day in, day out, year in, year out. And this is about stopping that kind of exploitation. So I'd ask you to support this. It is sending a clear message. It becomes virtually a decision of council that informs the administration. That's all we're doing. Members, those in favour? Those against? That is lost. Division. division. Councillors, a division has been called on the motion. Those in favour of the motion, please rise and remain standing until all names have been called. Councillor Moran, Councillor Hyde, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Martin, Councillor Sims. Uh, members, that takes us to 11.3. Council, uh, Councillor Martin. Next time, Lord Mayor, I'm going to submit them all separately and that way I might get a break in between. Um, um, you require a seconder for this motion? I do. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, uh, Lord Mayor, um, uh, the media coverage of this uh, potential event, uh, which would bring huge economic benefit to, to the city, uh, has uh, been extraordinary. The city is excited including backers like uh, Sanjeev Gupta, uh, the Morris Group, Steve Morris, and the internet guru, Simon Hackett. Uh, they're all on board and many others as well. Um, now, the intention of this motion, Lord Mayor, is to have you raise the possibility with the Premier um, of the City of Adelaide hosting the event when you have your Capital City Committee meeting at the end of this month, I think on the 28th, 29th. Um, now, it will require government financial support because the licence fee alone is just too great for this council. Um, but I've been informed by the bid group, and this is where we come in, that the licence owner Liberty Media in the United States won't grant a licence uh, to operate the event without the government of the state and the council of the city both agreeing that the event is to be held there. And what a great thing it would be for us too, by the way. Um, we join cities like uh, Paris, London, New York, Monaco, Berlin, uh, and many, many more. I think there are about 20 odd uh, that host this event. 
Uh, the most successful Formula E event was held quite recently in Zurich, where it was watched, I'm told, by 120,000 spectators. Now, I've, uh, I've had people say to me, as a consequence of the publicity, uh, you know, oh God, here's another uh, Crimson 500 on the way to Adelaide. Um, it is not that. Uh, the nature of the cars is quite different. Um, there's no noise. Uh, they don't require special road services uh, and they can navigate things like tram tracks. Uh, and they do that already on some international courses. And they're light, which means that you don't need those enormous concrete barriers that are erected together with the steel fences months in advance. In fact, the typical bump in and bump out for a Formula E event, including the day of the event, is 11 days. That's 11 days from start to finish. That's just extraordinary. Uh, maybe there's a, a lesson there for the Adelaide 500. Now, uh, in this scenario, we can have it running right through the city centre, and that, of course, would showcase all of our streets, our parks, the beauty of the place. And with any luck, uh, it might even go up the hill to North Adelaide, uh, where it would have some rub off for all of the businesses, the hospitality business, retailers, everybody. So uh, I don't need to tell elected members if, uh, if Adelaide can pull this off, it will be a huge boost for our city and our businesses. Um, uh, there are estimates that it could boost the local economy by about $50 million, $50 million for one event. So um, I urge all members to uh, get behind this. Thank you. Deputy Lord Mayor. Councillor Sims. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I wish to move an amendment. Um, that is that uh, part one stay the same, but the rest as presented on the, the screen. Um, I'm happy to read it out or, or take it as uh, written. I have circulated it um, prior to the meeting. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Uh, thank you. Um, I've spoken to Councillor Martin um, about this uh, amendment before putting it forward. I'm very supportive of what he is doing here. This amendment uh, reflects the fact that I was approached um, by groups external to the council who were excited about this, suggesting that it could be strengthened further and looking at um, an economic uh, study. Um, and I spoke to administration as well around um, how something like this could work in terms of um, council's existing plans. I really want to uh, commend Councillor Martin for putting this um, forward. You know, often um, in council, we, we talk about trying to encourage uh, business to come into the city. Um, and this is really an opportunity to do that. Um, it's something that I think could be quite transformational for the city of Adelaide and really put us on the map. Because Adelaide's been building a reputation as one of the world's leading green cities. And uh, this is really only going to strengthen that and showcase um, those credentials to the world. Um, I know uh, Councillor Kira is um, always very excited to hear about my time in the Senate, so I'll regale him with um, some of those tales. You know, one of um, the first bills that I put before the um, Senate was a bill to uh, subsidise the construction of electric cars here in South Australia. And um, electric cars represent huge opportunities for our economy in terms of reviving our state's manufacturing industry. And what I really love about this motion and this proposal from Councillor Martin is that it showcases that technology, puts it on the world stage and really shows what we can do here in South Australia. So um, I think this is just a, a brilliant suggestion. Um, in terms of um, Councillor Martin's point about the Adelaide 500, like many residents uh, that live in the south of the city, I do notice the huge uh, noise pollution caused by the Adelaide 500. It is hugely disruptive to our city's uh, festival season um, and uh, our fringe season. And you know, it may well be that this could be an alternative to Adelaide 500. It would be cleaner, um, it would be quieter, um, and it would be much more in line with our reputation as a clean green city. So um, I really encourage councillors to get behind this and um, let's see um, what uh, what comes. But I think it's a, a really exciting proposal and something that could be really transformational for the City of Adelaide. Councillor Moran. Members, anybody else like to speak to this? Sorry, okay. Councillor Canal, then Councillor Kerr, then Councillor 
just a few words around the economic benefit, etc. I mean, uh, I, uh, you know, through through obviously through our businesses, etc. Um, to say for the normal uh, everyday uh, Adelaide business, these sorts of events, despite the fact that they're internationally maybe interesting and, and uh, certainly uh, certain segments of our economy may may benefit from them, but the everyday businesses, the the ones that are functioning during the course of the day, it is like another nail in the coffin because it excludes people from the city. I mean, all the all the particular events and all the rest of it, it is really great for the vibrancy and it, certainly all these are positives. But when you're talking about the everyday South Australian and everyday person from Greater Adelaide coming to the city, these are these sorts of events and ever increasing numbers of them only uh, uh, and reinforce uh, the lack of desire to come to the city as part of their, their normal uh, everyday shopping and normal everyday uh, things they do in life. And it's, it's increasingly seen that way. And I, I, again, conversations today with, with uh, you know, business owners that despite, you know, say the, the, the nighttime economy and things like that, which obviously benefit that, but it does exclude people from the city, which means that during this entire time, uh, most of the businesses suffer from, you know, people avoiding the city, uh, the congestion around these events. It is not, I mean, my wife, we live just outside the city, one hour to drive five kilometres. Um, and these are the sorts of examples, um, despite the other sorts of effects that are positive, but uh, it does mean that we who are the mainstay of the, of the economy of Adelaide uh, suffer um, you know, in large, uh, much greater, uh, and therefore it also means that less and less people use the city as their destination of choice. And we need to consider those sorts of effects because ultimately they're the ones who contribute the majority of the jobs, and also our desire to bring city together and use Adelaide as the base uh, and also for the consolidation of, of the, our, our footprint as a city, um, we need to make sure that those things are also catered for and it is really critical uh, that we, we do that so that we do decrease the amount of the need for vehicles, we do all those sort of green things simply because we no longer need them and by, by increasing the number of these sorts of events uh, without really good consideration how you do them only means that uh, you will uh, make the city less likely to be that place that you people can uh, move towards and means that the suburbs can only keep on expanding. Thank you, Councillor Kerr. Uh, Lord Mayor, I just, I just wanted to make the observation, Councillor Sims talked about uh, this being a showcase for uh, technology. Uh, engine technology, we'd have a lot more, we'd have a lot bigger, more viable uh, manufacturing industry in South Australia. We'd have a lot more technology to showcase, if not for the price of electricity. Uh, <laughs> uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I'll speak against this for a couple of reasons. Um, I think uh, the main issue for me uh, in this is um, we simply can't go at this alone without a state government support. Um, and we know this very clearly. And I think the signal from Councillor Martin um, in his first motion talks about taking this to a capital city committee, which is really the right place to have a chat about it and discuss it. I think Councillor Sims' amendment is going a further step by committing funds from the city of Adelaide without that nod that we have seen yet from the state government. So I think the response we've seen publicly uh, has been yes, but maybe not now. So we just need to have that chat, I think, at a capital city committee level before we have a commitment of funds. Um, and the other thing I'd like to see is uh, for us to have an understanding of the business case and an understanding of what funds are we committing? I mean, you know, the motion here talks about an allocation of funds. Are we allocating 50? Are we allocating 150, 200,000? It's not very clear. Um, unfortunately, we can't just dish out money. So I think it's important that we have the discussion at the capital city committee level first. I understand the dynamics of the state government, I understand it's required, and then that will trigger the next discussion around the business case, the feasibility discussion, uh, and to work out how this will be progressed. Um, look, I, I think this is an initiative that's been flying around for a while, um, and I think it's important that this council has the opportunity to explore it. Uh, but like I said, I think we can't go at this alone, and we've heard before that even the former E organisers are not prepared to do that without a tick from the City of Adelaide and also the stack up. So there's a tick from us in principle in the first motion, and that's, I think, the enough enough of a signal from us. Until we start seeing a tick from the state, I think we shouldn't spend a dollar on this. 
Thank you, members. If not, I'll go back to Councillor Sims to sum up. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Look, just to clarify, I think the Deputy Lord Mayor may have misunderstood the um, amendment that I'm putting forward. It's not committing any council funds at all. It's saying administration contact the state government to understand the economic benefits of hosting the Formula E car race event within the City of Adelaide and asks if the state government has done a feasibility study or investigated its viability and then considers the allocation of funds for a study of the economic benefits if a feasibility study or investigation has not been undertaken. And then if the licence for the event is secured by the state government, request that administration work with the stakeholders to investigate options. So there's a lot of ifs in there. Um, and they're there really to recognise the fact that as um, the Deputy Lord Mayor says, we do need to work in partnership with the state government on this. Um, but what I wanted to do was make sure that we can keep, you know, excuse the pun, driving this forward um, by uh, making sure that it can be progressed. So I'd encourage you to um, support this amendment as a way of strengthening what, um, what Councillor Martin has, um, has put forward. Members, uh, we'll go to the vote. Those in favour of the amendment? Those against? That is lost. We go division. back to... Division. Councils, the division has been called on the amendment. Those in favour of the amendment, please rise and remain standing until all names have been called. Councillor Moran, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Martin, Councillor Sims. So we go back to the original motion. Is there any other further discussion? If not, I'll go back to Councillor Martin to sum up. Yeah, thank you. Look, I'll be very brief, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I disagree with uh, Councillor Canole. I, I, I do accept that for some businesses, whether it's small goods or fish or whatever, it may not be uh, an excellent stimulator of sales. But an event like this, with the potential to bring 40, 50 million dollars uh, to the state in economic outcomes, is good business. It is good business for restaurants. It's good business for bars. It's good business for hotels. It's good for this city. And, and any suggestion that uh, you know the fringe, the festival, and other things of that nature aren't the way ahead for this city, I think, is quite wrong. I think those are the, the things that we do uh, to stimulate not only uh, economic activity but the city's reputation. And I just want to point out uh, there have been extraordinary letters of support um, from people uh, all over South Australia. But significantly, and this is always the, the issue with events like this, uh, sponsorship. Uh, it is in fact the thing that is causing the greatest heartburn for uh, the, uh, the car race that, uh, that we host every March. Um, here we have SA Power Networks. Uh, writing to the organisers saying, we're in, count us as one of your partners in this event. Um, and that's because this event opens up a whole new area of potential uh, advertisers and sponsors, power networks, mining companies uh, who manufacture the components for these cars. All of them are interested in sponsoring this event. In fact, in, uh, in Santiago, uh, the major sponsor of the Formula E event there is a mining company. So these are names that have not yet been tapped. Uh, I do hope that by endorsing this, uh, we do get a conversation going with the state government and we're on the road, if you'll pardon the pun, on the road to uh, a Formula E event in the not too distant future. Was that pun too bad? Well, may I just it say? was. I'm not planning any more puns tonight. I think I've heard quite enough. Um, those in favour? Those against, that is carried. Thank you. And 11.4, we go to Councillor Sims. I'm back from electric cars to the uh, City Connector bus. Um, I move that Council reaffirms its commitment to the continuation of the joint City of Adelaide and State Government City Connector bus service in the 2019-2020 budget and calls on the State Government to continue to fund their contribution to this vital community service. I seek a second. Thank you, Councillor. Looking for a seconder. Councillor Moran. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, look, uh, like um, many uh, residents and ratepayers, I have been concerned around um, media reports that um, the state government is now reviewing its funding for the um, 
as State Government and Adelaide City Council City Connector Bus Service. Um, I refer in particular to a, a report um, in, in Daily a few weeks ago um, where it was noted that um, councils being notified that the state are reconsidering reducing their contribution to the service by 50%. Um, and that is really concerning um, to me, Lord Mayor. This is a service that is used by many, many people in our community. Um, in fact, I asked administration for some figures um, on the usage of the service before tonight's meeting. And um, they advised me that um, there are approximately 20,000 boardings per week or around 1 million passengers per year. 1 million passengers per year that use our service. That's really significant, Lord Mayor. And in terms of the reasons why people use the free city connected bus, they're varied. Um, some do so for medical appointments, 24% uh, do so for getting to work, 29% do so for shopping and entertainment, and so of course that brings a benefit to uh, our local businesses, 16% do so for social and recreation, and 21% do so for study. So people use the bus for a range of reasons, but what I think is really great about it is that they're actually using the bus, they're taking public transport. Um, and we know that that reduces congestion on our roads. It also reduces carbon emissions, so it's, it's good for our environment as well. What this motion does is uh, makes it very clear that council is committed to continuing to fund the service, but it also calls on the state government to step up um, because they have been cutting public bus services throughout the state. And uh, I don't want to see them do the same thing in the city of Adelaide. I don't want to see them throw our community under the bus. I want to see this, um, some, uh, I want to see this as something that is uh, protected into the long term. And um, that's why I'm putting this motion forward. So this would guarantee our funding, but also really strengthen our arm and indeed your arm, Lord Mayor, to advocate on our behalf um, and really push for the government to ensure that they make good on their commitment so that we can continue to run this service. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Councillor Moran? Members, Councillor Ho? Hi, Lord Mayor. I would like to move an amendment. I discussed this with Councillor Sims before, so yeah, just on the screen. I may give you a brief for a second, though. sorry. Okay. Just, um, so, Councillor Canal. Thank you. Thank you. Well, basically, I try to make it very clear that if somehow the state government cut its funding. We only got half of the fund. And we need to find our way to run the buses with our own, I mean, with our own fund, all right? So, and I understand that we, I mean, I want to keep the service, but how to run the service, how to run these buses with half of the funding, I leave it to the ME. Thank you. Councillor Knapp. Mm -hmm. Councillor Martin. Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I want to thank uh, Councillor Sims, but also Councillor Ho for this uh, amendment. Um, it is such a vital service, and uh, the publicity that surrounded uh, the administration proposing to us in our first round of budget considerations that we withdraw funding brought such a howl of protests from residents uh, in North Adelaide. Um, there are few things which are sacrosanct. The connector bus is one of them. People treasure that vehicle, uh, not only because it moves them about, because it's their connection to the city. Um, it began, as um, many people would remember, as a, a 10-seater Toyota bus, which was damned uncomfortable and stinking hot in summer, um, uh, but it grew and grew and grew. And now, if you want to remove it, let me tell you, I think they would burn effigies of you in the streets of North Adelaide. So whatever happens, whether the state government is genuinely talking about reducing its commitment, if it is genuinely talking about trying to put more of the burden on uh, uh, the city council, we just need to find a way to keep it going because it is now a core responsibility, a core activity um, that is going to be almost impossible to take away. Councillor Abraham today. Lord Mayor, I've got a quick question off administration. Um, so what would happen if the state government um, seized the funding? Did we have a um, um, did we have a backup option or a plan B or anything like that? Uh, CEO. Through Lord Mayor, I just need to say that um, 
there is going to be a report to committee next week on this matter. Um, we'll be tabling the correspondence from DIPTI so you can have a full look at that. Um, and um, that's going to inform our budget deliberations. So just putting that in the background. Um, I guess, actually I wouldn't mind, Beth, you've been doing a bit of work on this. Could you help just with that response? Thanks, Mark. Through you, Lord Mayor. Um, what would the recommendation be? I, I'd have to say that generally, when another level of government removes funding, um, a council would reduce its contribution commensurately. That would be a, a general practice. Um, having said that, I, I know how many people value this service um, and um, and strong community sentiment that would go with that. So there are a number of um, uh, different routes that the bus takes around the city. Um, one of the um, points that has been put to us, and as Mark said, um, we're bringing a report to you next Tuesday to committee, um, and we've, we've timed that to come next Tuesday so that you can be considering that as a part of the um, considerations of the draft budget before it goes out for consultation. So it may be that um, the different routes are looked at. Um, it's been suggested to us that tram, the new, the extended tram does compensate or does duplicate some of that. That will be something that, we're in, that we are analysing at the moment and um, that'll be brought to you. So that would be one consideration. Um, council may choose to increase their funding um, or council may, as, as this method suggests, look for um, alternative sources of funding. I don't have any suggestions for that at the moment or indeed to increase its own contribution. Um, I'd also note that at the moment it is a free service. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sims. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, and I, I do want to thank um, Councillor Ho for um, speaking to me about this amendment um, before the meeting and um, having a chat with me um, about that. I, I really appreciate that courtesy and, and I think um, it's a good model for us to uh, adopt um, here in uh, this place. I do support the amendment because um, it actually, um, if the state government says no, it looks at how we can keep this service going in terms of looking at other options um, and having discussions. So I think that makes sense. Um, I think, you know, it's really critical that this remains a free service. Um, and it's really critical that we continue our current funding. And what this motion does is it makes that clear. It says we can commit it in our budget to the continuation of the funding and it calls on the state government to do the same. And that's the really critical part of this. We have to be out there um, advocating very strongly for the government to maintain their funding for this service because we have seen what the state government have done in other areas. They have been cutting um, public bus routes um, and services and they should not be doing so here in the city of Adelaide. We've seen um, the huge patronage there is for this service and um, I really want to see it continue. Um, and uh, I do commend Councillor Ho for his support and interest in the bus service. I know it's something that he's passionate about um, and um, I look forward to being able to work with him and others as we keep pushing this because it is really, really critically important. Thank you. I have Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I'll be brief. I think it's, um, we just need to be mindful of the signalling too, because the minute we're going to say is that we're going to fund the whole lot, I can guarantee you the state government will not continue with their funding and it will fall back on us. I think we need to think smart about this as well. I think uh, there's probably an opportunity for us to do an audit of the service, especially with the rollout of the North Terrace um, tram infrastructure. Uh, and once that's sort of come online properly, um, I guess, you know, do we have the opportunity to reroute the routes, to look at other options, et cetera. I'm also mindful um, that we need to do an audit of who actually uses the service, uh, because I'm all for residents, businesses, et cetera, to use it. But I mean, if people are using North Adelaide as a parking lot to then get on a parking ride, uh, free bus shuttle to the city um, and work a full nine hour day, and then go back to North Adelaide and pick up their car, and go back home, uh, that is also an issue. So I think there's things there we need to look at from a service auditing perspective where if a business has been here, which we have potentially with a with a cut of funding, how do we still run the service at the right level for the right people? 
um, instead of having to just be a complete open service solution. It doesn't have to be cost. It doesn't have to be necessarily uh, a ticketed uh, platform where people have to pay and charge, but potentially people need to produce a card or they need to somehow be registered, et cetera, et cetera, to use the service. I'm not sure. But I think if we can sort of look at all those options um, as part of uh, item three, because I think that the part I'm interested in item three is obviously you investigate the funding models one, but also the alternate routes discussion, which could talk to how do we become more effective, more efficient, uh, and potentially with the same money, we can do more. Um, and also, I don't know if there's a, if we're going to be taking on this seriously, I don't know if there's going to be an, an opportunity around autonomous shuttles, other things that we could use as well, uh, that we could potentially build into our long financial plan uh, and look at, you know, if this is something we're going to consider in the way of transport for our city, then let's think about it in the long term, not just in the short term and just throw money at it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kanal. And just a, a couple of comments around that. Um, I mean, this is one of the major issues and interests of mine. And I think uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's something that we should really look at. And it's again, it's just expanding a fraction more on, uh, uh, on the Deputy Lord Mayors, is that we should be working closely with the state government on how this can be uh, integrated as, as much as possible into that uh, city-wide uh, commute so that we can use it as an alternative for the, the large buses that meander through the city um, and, you know, and that are really provide a good focus on, on how getting people around the city in an appropriate and efficient way. And I think it's really critical that we, if we can work closer, the government can uh, certainly uh, get advantages by uh, limiting the amount of large buses uh, going around the city and, and uh, to a, you know keeping it to a main, few main streets where we can use these services that become an active part of that extended public transport system and also enabling still a bit of flexibility and with any sort of new infrastructure that may come along. Thank you. Members, no other comments? I'll go back to Councillor Ho to sum up. Thank you, members. If we can now vote, those in favour, those against, that becomes a substantive, that's carried. I'll go, are there any other discussion? If not, I'll go back to Councillor Sims to sum up. Thank you, members, to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Thank you. We now go to item 11.5, Councillor Sims. Don't worry, members, this is my last motion tonight. Um, I move that Council notes that an unsolicited proposal has been received from the Adelaide Football Club relating to the establishment of a sports and community centre on the Adelaide Parklands and request that administration arrange a public consultation, including a community forum in North Adelaide, to hear the views of residents and ratepayers. Thank you. I have a seconder in, Councillor Moran. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, this is a very uh, straightforward um, motion. As members know, we have received an unsolicited proposal from the Adelaide Crows regarding uh, their plans to build um, a sports and community centre on the Adelaide parklands. This is public land, Lord Mayor, and it belongs to all of us, and indeed it belongs to all South Australians. And so our ratepayers shouldn't be reading of proposals relating to the aquatic centre or the parklands through the media. They should be hearing about that direct from their council, from their elected representatives. After all, we are the landlords. To use another pun, we've had a few of them tonight, we are the umpire um, in this matter. We um, are the adjudicator. <laughs> I, um, I must say um, I was uh, interested to read the federal government gifting millions of dollars to the Crows to support them in this endeavour. Um, but, you know, the parkland shouldn't be used as a pawn in the federal election campaign, and we're about to head into one of those um, very soon, I suspect. And so in the height of the politics that will come with a federal election, I think it's really, really critical that we take pause and we consult with our community before this is progressed um, any further. And so really, this is a simple proposal. It says we've received a, um, a proposal from the Crows. Let's talk to the community about it. Let's arrange a public consultation. And as part of that, let's have a forum in North Adelaide and hear from residents and hear from businesses about what they think and about what they want out of any such um, plan should it proceed. Um, I'd be really, really keen to hear from the community directly about their wants and needs um, before this is progressed any further. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Right. Members? <laughs> Deputy Lord Mayor, then Councillor Martin. 
Lord Mayor, I, don't, I think this is another political stunt. Uh, I have no idea what we're actually going to go out to consult the community on. Like, no clue. Uh, there is a very active policy within this current administration that talks about how an unsolicited bid is conducted. And as we've seen in the administrative comments, it says very clearly that at stage two, when the proponent decides to take it to the next step and submit something to consult on, we can then go out and we are actually forced to consult with the community as part of our policy. So it says it very clearly when it will happen. What this motion will do is just set out a frenzy for no reason whatsoever of a question is, do you want them to go in or not? We're not having a discussion about what community service they want, where is it going to be, what kind, what kind of design, is it energy, energy efficient, nothing. We're not talking about any of that. All that they have received as a result of federal funding is money. They haven't received money because they are going in the aquatic centre or another site. They haven't done any of that at all. They simply received a line of funding. What happens next is up to them. If they decide tomorrow not to progress uh, through the unsolicited bid process, what happens? We've gone out to a community consultation and then we've done what? Spent money, engaged, talked about what exactly? I'm not sure. And then we stop, they haven't proceeded. They need to proceed to the next stage, as the policy clearly says, work out on deliverables for this council, present the proposal to this administration for this council to consider, then we will have an opportunity to go out to our community and engage with them properly on a type of service, on the location, everywhere else. And let me remind members that the way we got here is because all of us, through a workshop and through the media, and Councillor Moran led this, has actually instructed them to not go to the nursery and consider the aquatic centre. She planted the seed. That's where it started. That's the first time I've heard about it in the media, was through Councillor Moran. So when they suggested two things, Councillor Moran noted publicly that she prefers the aquatic centre, and maybe, or maybe not, they may go there. Until they proceed to the next stage, we don't know. So I'd urge members to not support this because we're going out to a witch hunt, nothing else. This is a question of, do you want them there? You don't want them there. That's all it is. Let's get a proposal, a solid proposal, on what will happen and how that talks to the precinct. How does that talk to the specific area? Let's work out what we need to do and then we will consult. We can go out to the community with everything we've got, all the information so they are clear on what we're consulting on. At the moment, there is no clarity. Councillor Martin. Look, I think you, Lord Mayor. Um, I, I disagree with just about everything that Councillor Elliott says. Um, look, there is a frenzy out there. There is a great frenzy because this is actually out in the community. The Crows published a news story, or a news story was published on Sunday, in which the Crows said, we are moving to North Adelaide to the Aquatic Centre. That's what the news story said. So this is out there. Now, um, people are extremely distrustful of this council. You know, we've been saying for weeks, there's no formal proposal from the Crows. Now we're saying, oh, well, there's a bid that came through our formal process of unsolicited bids. That's regarded as double talk. People are distrustful. And I believe that we as a council have been set up by the Crows for a fall. We've been set up in a play. And, and that play is about a parkland scrap. Now, uh, if you read the document that's in front of us tonight, um, there is a, a very subtle uh, illustration of what I'm talking about. The comment here talks about the feasibility of the proposal, how it will be delivered and whether it represents value for money, how the demolition of the aquatic centre is best structured to deliver the best outcome for council. Nowhere, nowhere is there a discussion of the principle, and that principle is that the parklands are for recreation and not for the headquarters of any money-making professional organisation, whether it's a football club or a factory. That principle is not understood in this room, and especially by Councillor Abbott over there. The council says it's vehemently opposed, this council says it's vehemently opposed to a hotel on Adelaide Oval because it's a money-making enterprise. Now, the Crow's proposal to demolish the aquatic centre and build a complex hosting restaurants, bars, retail, medical facilities, train rooms, a gym, a car park, and God knows what else, is all about making money. So 
if you are opposed to the hotel, you cannot support the Crows Aquatic Centre development without running the risk of being a hypocrite. They are exactly the same thing. They are intrusions of money-making enterprises onto the parklands. And uh, we're on very dangerous territory here. We are really in dangerous ter territory because uh, not only are we entertaining this, and we are by discussing it in this way with those words there, we've also said tonight, oh, um, we don't vote against the helipad on the parklands. That's not ruled out. We've also just out, uh, cleaned out Adler. We've taken out all of the council representatives bar one and removed Councillor Moran. And at the same time, we are entertaining discussions with Golf Course Master Plan. Perhaps that's the next one. Uh, the Commons, who are talking, uh, sorry, the Reds, who are talking about a facility. Sorry, Councillor Martin, have you finished? I have now, Lord Mayor. Um, I say, if we are really courageous, if we want to know what people think, then we do what Councillor Sims is suggesting. We ask, ask them about the principle. I have Councillor Hyde, then Councillor Moran. Sorry, Councillor Moran. Um, I drew a line in the sand or the grass, as it were, um, when I spoke earlier. Um, and when I spoke, I mentioned exclusive commercialization. I do not consider um, what may or may not occur to the exclusive commercialisation of the parklands, although I am broadly in principle against it. But I would note that we haven't seen any proposal yet come to us. We haven't seen one. The public hasn't seen one. And this motion, I think, as it was said earlier today, is a political stunt. It is grossly irresponsible grossly irresponsible, um, and it aims purely to whip up a frenzy to knock a proposal on its head that has not even been afforded the airtime or the time at all um, to become a mature proposal. What I want to see this become, um, and I made this point multiple times to, to members here, is, is an opportunity for us to return, to have a net gain of footprint to the parklands, to be able to remove uh, a concrete, um, and decrepit aberration on the parklands, that is the aquatic centre, that is also, by the way, not really used by ratepayers, um, and to replace it with a, with a facility that is uh, hopefully sympathetic to green um, and sustainable design, something that is not an aberration uh, on, on, the, on the site of the parklands um, at all, something that blends in with the structure, and, and to actually have um, an increased offering of services, not only to our ratepayers, but to those coming into the city as well. Um, and the reason this motion is irresponsible is it, because <clears throat> it seeks to destroy that opportunity. It seeks to destroy that opportunity for rank political gain. And, and I cannot support that. So, so I'll reiterate, and, and as well for the benefit of anyone in the gallery or watching at home, the Adelaide Aquatic Centre unsolicited bid proposal and process, which we have not seen yet, presents an opportunity for us to return more land to the parklands, to rid the city of Adelaide of an ailing and decrepit asset in the Aquatic Centre. It also allows us the opportunity to increase the services we are offering to ratepayers. It allows us the opportunity uh, to, to uh, have an economic stimulus for North Adelaide and for the, and for the businesses in that region, as well as the city overall. Um, and, and it presents us the opportunity to build, a, a, or to have built, to direct to be built, to make it required to be built, a facility that is, that is clean, that is green, that takes up less space in the aquatic centre, that looks better than the aquatic centre, a facility that is open to the public by and large, uh, which is our first and foremost requirement, and the Oval Hotel is not open to the public. Um, and it's a facility that I want to, if this comes to pass, I want to be able to walk through this and to still feel like I am walking through a park. That is my requirement. That is how I will look at any unsolicited proposal. Thank you. The CEO wished to make a comment, and then oh, I've got. On. The CEO wishes to make a comment, and then I have Councillor Moran, Kouras, Abraham Zadeh, and Councillor Kerra. Three, Lord Mayor, I won't talk for long. Um, <laughs> I will not enter the debate. I just need to confirm some facts and the process. I think it's important for you in your conversation. 
First of all, we need to clearly state that we, we are in the very, very early stage, stage one of three stages of the unsolicited proposals process. Stage one of three stages. Stage two will commence soon uh, with full consideration of the feasibility proposal by council. So it's important to know that. We are yet to receive a detailed proposal or business case from the Adelaide Football Club. We are yet to receive anything. Um, I confirm that the administration will incorporate in stage two what we call a participation framework, a specific requirement for community consultation as a precondition to any formal decisions of council um, regarding any proposal put forward by the Adelaide Football Club. So that is a requirement of the unsolicited proposals process. Um, I had intended to provide to council uh, details of the consultation process before we undertake it. So there is full awareness and understanding. In other words, I think it's an, an essential part of the unsolicited bid process is that the community would be consulted on any AFC proposal we receive. That is before the council takes any decision to proceed with that proposal. Very, very clear. Um, we would look to engage with the community when we have enough detail regarding the proposal so that the community can make an informed decision. That's what we would do. Um, I think that's likely to be some way off um, and we would be working with the AFC to develop up their proposal so we can know what we can bring back to you. That is what we're trying to do at the moment. We're looking to do that as soon as possible because I know there's a lot of interest. So it's in no one's interest that it doesn't happen soon. Um, I must say that the Adelaide Football Club is aware that their investment in development of the proposal is, is the entirely debate. at their risk. I'm just telling you the process. This is entering the debate. Thank you, advice. Uh, the CEO is outlining lining the process and I think he's nearly finished. I'm just saying that the Adelaide Football Club are investing in, in the development of the proposal at their own risk and council has made no commitment and the council administration has made no commitment at this time. So I just wanted to be clear you understood the process and we're ready. Thanks. Thank you, CEO. Councillor Moran. Yes, um, the, cat, the CEO was entering the debate by asking us to wait till the process says consultation. Um, and I, I think that's an unwise thing to do. This motion is actually catching up because the media and the public are already talking about it. And what um, Councillor Sims will have moved it is trying to do is to get us in front of what is already happening. The um, public, now I had to sit through hours of select committee today dodging questions about when is an unsolicited bid at a proposal. We have received something, we've re received an unsolicited bid. That is what, in normal people speak, is the beginning of a proposal. Um, our ratepayers have been reading about it, and this really is, with all due respect, a North Adelaide issue. This is where the Crows Club is going to be. I'm an alderman and I, it's my, I have a mandate to talk about it. I suggest that ward councillors uh, have a lesser role in this. Um, point of order, Lord Mayor, this is not appropriate. It's not appropriate. Um, this is an area we know of very well, Mary, myself, Phil and the other um, councillors. So if we want to go and consult our ratepayers that are most directly affected by it, this, this motion has already done that. It's, it's now put out there that it's an unsolicited bid, which I'm glad it's put out. Um, it's now will spark debate. Let's do it in a formal, reasonable way. I don't want to present my ratepayers with a, a complicated uh, walking through Alex Hardex, it's going to look lovely, it won't just be officers. Um, <laughs> I want them to say, do they want us to even take one step down this? I want a yes and no answer. We'll be getting one from the public because this motion is a public motion. And I don't want to waste the football. If we get back an 80% uh, statistically significant no, we don't want you to, to do that, then I think that we should um, listen to that. Um, uh, I don't agree with Phil that we're against money-making um, uh, things in the parklands. Um, what we're against is the annexing of by a commercial business to the public. And I think Councillor had it's, it's naive to think that you're going to walk through it and it'll be like 
They're already going to have to take black fries oval. They're taking other ovals. Um, it, it won't be, you won't be able to wander through a little green garden. It'll be the crow's shed and uh, the likelihood of that. But that's, that's taking another step too far. We're not even at that level. We are just saying, do you, do you rate players of Adelaide? And particularly, uh, I'm not meaning to offend your rate players some, but particularly the people that live in North Adelaide and work and have businesses in North Adelaide, they are the most intimately affected. Um, if I could just have a little bit more. Um, Members? Um, I think, as I just re to reiterate, we need to get on the front foot here. Um, we need to tell them yes or no. I don't know. I'm thinking no now. Because when it first brought up, some's right, they said the nursery with the new building or take over the management of the aquatic centre. And I don't even have much of a problem with that. Um, you know, we manage it now. They could manage it. Some of the unused buildings at the back could be their offices. But when it's a new building, not even on the same spot, if they want a good parklands um, place, I suggest the now um, almost empty police barracks, which are adjacent, much closer to the Adelaide Oval, uh, beautiful old buildings that can't be pulled down and could use the, um, the Cricket Association's ovals that have just been done up for millions and millions of dollars. And I'm sure that we have to share them. There are other places. This is not appropriate. This is exactly like the hotel and it will preclude members of the public. It's not just going to be a product centre, it's going to be the Crow's headquarters and the Crow's shed. So I think we should ask our people straight away, do you want this at all? Do you want us to progress this? And the answer will be no. Councillor Kouros. Wow. Okay. So um, new to council, um, so it was very clear to us when the Crows approached us and asked us whether we go ahead with the uh, bid to put uh, their headquarters in North Adelaide. In the meeting, we all agreed that they can go ahead and present to us stage two. Um, which Objection, we did not. We did not. I did we not say in that meeting that if we want to go ahead with the entertainment proposal? I remember that that was agreed upon. Correct me if I'm wrong. Sorry, see how it's going. Everyone I agree? Three, Lord Mayor. Steve, can you help us with this? There wasn't I can't agreement. recall if it was unanimous, but I think that there was some direction. No, it, was, just it need, was not unanimous. No, I just need to caution. It wasn't members, everybody. I just need to caution members as well as to what's currently in confidence in relation oh, to the bid and the meetings sorry. that we may be discussing. Okay, tonight. well, Thank I'm you. new to council, so I mean, I'm trying to work through this process. So now we're up to stage two, um, where um, if they decide to put in a bid, um, that's when we go out to community consultation. Correct. Okay. All right, so um, I, ha I too am a North Ward councillor and uh, I have been speaking to uh, the community and more importantly, the businesses. And they have actually well, been- the businesses are more important. Uh, Members. More importantly, the businesses who are suffering at the moment um, actually have welcomed the idea of the crows coming into North Adelaide. I would like to see the proposal of what it is, but of course, I think it's great that we do cons cons consult the community. We need to consult the community. Um, and until we get there, we don't know what it's made up of. So when people approach me and ask me about the crows coming to North Adelaide, I tell them the truth. And the truth is, I do not know what it is. I do not know where it actually is and where they, we are agreeing for it to be. I don't know what it, the facility is gonna be made up of. I don't even know what it looks like. So how can we sit here and say no completely and when we don't even really go and consult to the community when we don't even know what we're consulting on? What is it that we're going to consult them on? Just that the Crows are thinking about setting up their headquarters in North Adelaide. Yes. Is that it? Yes. So, but wouldn't they like to see a full proposal? And I think everyone would need to really analyse this and be open to it because as we can see, North Adelaide is suffering and um, they do need to be injected with some anchor tenant in there. And maybe this is the answer, maybe not. Maybe everyone will agree that this shouldn't happen. Who knows? But until we get to the stage two and we put it out there to the community, we won't know. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Ibrahim Zadeh. Lord Mayor, I'd like to highlight that I, um, uh, rise tonight as a supporter of the Port Adelaide Football Club. So, <laughs> I have noted. Um, 
Councillor Moran and Councillor Martin did mention that uh, there were um, um, uh, stories published um, around the, the crows moving into um, onto this site. Um, and I agree with them that that's not the way the community should find out about these sort of things. I agree, and I, and I am disappointed that the community found out uh, about this, uh, did this idea or this concept uh, through the media. Really, that happened as a result of a leak, I think. And it's disappointing that um, some people don't understand or appreciate the concept of commercial and confidence. Um, I'm not going to get uh, get stuck into the debate or the, or the detail uh, too much, but I'd like to highlight point number four that um, uh, administration have provided, and that is the timing and nature of community engagement has not yet been confirmed. <coughs> so we're we trying to run before uh, we can even walk. So I think we're uh, we're jumping the gun um, there a little bit, but uh, I guess to demonstrate that a little bit further. This is what we're consulting on. A blank piece of paper. No, principal. This is what we're consulting on. A blank no, piece of paper. Thank you, Councillor Kerr. Oh, Lord Mayor, all I, all I want to say, all I want to add to this is just, just to remind ourselves uh, that um, the, the public actually has delegated us to make decisions. The public has delegated. Let's leave. Let's leave. Uh, the, the, the public yeah. has. The public. The public has. Let's not forget. There is a significant component. Members. There is a significant component of the election process, which is about the public delegating to us the role of appraising proposals, the role of deciding on proposals. That is actually there. That you know, it's not like this is massive people who want to know immediately straight away you know we, I, I mean I, I, I agree you know it was not the best way for it to go in the media first but that let's credit the public with a little bit more than that they are realistic the public especially our ratepayers because they work so hard to make the money that pays the rates there is an element to which we are delegated to do this I'm sorry this is just a bit weird and stunty you know it's it's, it's supposed to we are we're going to be able to have this out but to bypass, to say that we're, you know, we're going to be played out and somehow we're so dumb that we can't see a play when it comes before us, I, I don't buy that. I, you know. Councillor Martin, you've already spoken. I Can wish to ask a question, if I may, um, uh, through you, Lord Mayor of the Administration. Uh, given that there are clear expectations that have been detailed tonight by councillors, Councillor Hyde expecting an open park with a walk-through space, a smaller footprint. Is size. there a question, Councillor Martin? Yes, let me get to the question. Um, how extensive, or is there indeed, a list of uh, um, guiding principles that have been given to the Crows to inform their process of developing a design? CEO. Thanks, Steve. Three, Lord Mayor. Uh, the report that was presented to Council more recently did outline a process through what Mark has identified, sorry, the CA has identified earlier about the participation framework and the detailing of first principles. Um, but I'm not in a position, obviously, to extend those in the public forum at the moment. Now I'm asking, is there a set of guiding principles as there have been with 88 O'Connell Street, as there has been with the Central Market and other projects with which the Council's associated? Those were formed in confidence. There was a report provided to Council in confidence that outlined the nature of those and the, any principles around that will be included in the participation framework agreement. Could, could the administration provide a copy of that to elected members? Three, Lord Mayor. Council members would all have a copy of that report. Um, so happy to provide it again if you wish. Well, look, I'm sorry, I can't remember seeing a list of guiding principles. I'd like to see it. Thank you, Councillor Ho. Hi, Lord Mayor. Can I have the motion to be put? I, Councillor Sims. Oh, so if we have a seconder, uh, has to be someone that hasn't spoken. And so, Councillor Knoll. Okay, so now we have to vote that the motion be put. Those in favour of the motion being put. Those against the motion 
can now be put. <laughs> and now we vote on the motion. Those in favour? Those against? Division. That is lost. Division. Councillors, a division has been called on the motion. Those in favour of the motion, please rise and remain standing until all names have been called. Councillor Moran, Councillor Martin, Councillor Sims. Thank you, councillors. We will go to 11.6, Councillor Donovan, City Bikeways. I'd like to move a slight variation. Slight variation to the motion. Yes, thank you. Um, so I have provided it, so I'd like to uh, just remove, as shown on the screen, so that it is prepare bikeway concept designs in preparation for community engagement for the Piri Weymouth Street corridor with two options as follows, and the remainder is the same. <laughs> Just a moment, Councillor, we'll just show what's been deleted. There we go. Um, I'll seek a second, Deputy Lord Mayor. You speak your motion, Councillor. So I've made the variation after discussions with fellow councillors, and I think this is a, an excellent compromise to be able to actually move forward on this on this bikeway uh, project. And and I think that is the outcome that um, the city residents, users, businesses, uh, ratepayers, visitors would be most hopeful for to get an outcome and to actually get some movement on this on this bikeway, which has now been uh, in train for quite some time. And, and this is a really exciting opportunity for the Piri Weymouth corridor to be reinvigorated for people. So, you know, this gives us the opportunity to look at the full corridor to see how we can reinvigorate our footpaths, our bikeways, um, and really uh, bring people to this area. And, and we know already that it is the second most utilised uh, bikeway in the city. So it's an excellent choice for us to focus our efforts and ensure that we we provide the safe separated bikeway to connect into the rest of the network that we've already done. This is still a step um, in the process. Uh, we know from the workshop that we did very recently that by completing another element of our uh, bike network, we will provide a substantial uptake in um, in the opportunity for people who ride bikes to be able to come to the city to use these streets, which of course frees up opportunity for other transport modes because bringing more people in by bike of course frees up our car parking and frees up our on-street parks, um, which is an excellent outcome for all. We know that anywhere that we put in a separated bikeway, we are gonna increase our retail spend. We are gonna increase the, the uh, usage of that area. Um, research shows us this in cities around the world. So this is going to be a fantastic outcome and I'm really pleased to have had some conversations with other councillors to get the support, to get movement on this and, and, and get an excellent outcome for our, our city streets. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Deputy Lord Mayor. Members, Councillor Hyde. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I rise in support of this uh, excellent motion put by my uh, fellow South Ward councillor. Um, and I'd just like to make the point in doing so, obviously there was a, a little bit of friction in the room um, uh, when there was a previous bike way motion brought um, uh, and I moved uh, to have it go to a workshop. Now I was thoroughly um, uh, pleased with what administration produced as far as a, an engagement strategy goes to make sure that when we undertake large infrastructure projects, which is sometimes um, uh, controversial for, for the stakeholders involved, that we do it in a proper and considered manner. And just like I said earlier, that we cannot possibly consult on a proposal that does not yet exist. Um, uh, similarly, the, the thing that we were talking about earlier was opening the floodgates and consulting and everything. So I'm very, very pleased um, that, we've, that we've firmed up on what our options are here. Um, uh, that we're presenting uh, a viable way forward for the public and, and somewhat certainty for them, but at the same time, uh, the ability for them to contribute to the process. So um, as a cyclist myself, I'm very excited at the prospect of being to access the council uh, building and town hall itself are uh, using a separated bike path um, uh, because uh, Curry Street can be pretty hectic, uh, particularly in the mornings, as I say, on my way to work. So very pleased to support this motion. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Councillor Sims. 
Thank you, Lord Mayor. And look, I, I do appreciate um, uh, Councillor Donovan's efforts to try and break the gridlock on Council um, with respect to bikeways. And I see this as being a path forward. Uh, I mean, I, I do want to put on um, public record, I guess, my disappointment around Flinders Franklin uh, being um, moved off the agenda because um, I think that uh, that had been the subject of um, significant uh, discussion previously. Uh, that was well advanced um, and um, I recognise that uh, as a result of this we will be changing course. However, um, in the spirit of collegiality, I will support um, this motion and um, I'm keen for us now to get on with it. Thank you, Councillor Sins. Councillor Kouros? I'd just like to say thank you to Councillor Donovan for um, moving forward and, and you know, solving this. <laughs> Um, I think I, I support this motion. I think uh, the period waiver um, option is a, a good one. Um, it's just unfortunate we couldn't workshop it a bit more uh, in the committee meeting, but I think we're uh, getting there in the end and we're finally moving forward with a bike path. Thank you, members. Councillor Martin. Yes, Lord Mayor. Uh, may I begin with a question first? In September 2017, uh, Council formally resolved that Flinders Franklin would be the selection for our choice of east-west bikeway. How, it seems to be the consensus in the room here that that's been overturned. How is that done without a rescission motion? Excuse me. CEO. Let me just take some advice from Brett, thanks. We have previously received advice that if there is an existing resolution that is clear in terms of the preferred pathway, we would need to rescind that decision formally. So, um, CEO, then we are being asked to approve a resolution of council which is at odds with an existing motion which hasn't been rescinded. What is the process for dealing with that? So, See how you have to talk about that? Yeah, through Lord From what am I reading of the recommendation is that um, we prepare concept designs. We're not committing to the to the actual road until we've gone through that process. That's how I had read it. Um, so I thought it was quite appropriate to proceed in, in that current form. Oh, okay. Well, look, that changes my view. If Flinders Franklin stands, but we're merely having a look again at Piri Weymouth, then that's a reasonable outcome. I'll support that. Um, and in fact, uh, I, I'm pleased that we're having a look at it again because the last time we studied it, and you'll remember Lord Mayor and the CEO, that we spent a large sum of money investigating Peary Weymouth, and it was ruled out on the grounds that it would require for a separated bikeway for us to remove parking or on-street dining. And so I guess those two things are back on the table. Uh, and as I recall, Peary and Weymouth Street uh, businesses were quite concerned about uh, the loss of parking that would occur or the loss of on-street dining. Um, I fear, I fear that this will actually harm rather than help the cause because well, we have uh, a building full of people unhappy on Weymouth Street who'd be writing to us again today uh, and we're going to have a couple of streets full of businesses who are also concerned about Piri Weymouth. Um, it is, in my view, a, a bad outcome because it's that old council can't make up its mind again. But however, under the circumstances, I will support this. I, I do query, however, the second part of the motion, which seems to infer that a bikeway can only be delivered in a calendar year at a cost of $5.5 .5 million, when in fact, it is likely that council would be physically unable to complete a bikeway in one year, and therefore it's quite possible that the cost could be amortised over two years or three years or whatever the period was. Moreover, um, there's no consideration of the possibility that a particular design standard might require many years of construction. However, with those re reservations, I'll, I'll still support this uh, since um, both bikeways are still on the table. 
Members, I, did anybody else wish to speak to the motion? No, if not, Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor, just in, uh, in seconding this. Um, we've all um, gone through a, uh, an election recently and we've uh, knocked doors and spoken to people. I know in the Central Ward I've done that. Um, there is no appetite for a Flinders Franklin uh, discussion from the community and the white players that are impacted in that area, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure how many, uh, how many, uh, how many. Oh, I'm not, I've never seen Councillor Martin door knock that area, nor he should. Uh, but well, I, I, think, I have. Uh, uh, members, I, have. I think it's. Um, I think it's really important um, to note that this is an option. The previous discussion that we've had around the Flinders Franklin. Uh, was not a complete commit, it was a preferred bypass. It doesn't say commit to the project, move, it was a preferred bypass. And we've actually put the consultation on hold at the stage. That's what we've done before the election. That's where that is parked at the moment as a preferred and we put the consultation on hold. This is an opportunity to look at how much money we've got in the kitty, which says we've got 5.5 million, what can we deliver on that? And it also looks at other options and a full costed approach to deliver on a high standard of a separated, maybe we shouldn't call them bike ways from now on, we should call them you know, separated mobility ways or whatever, because everyone's going to be using these scooters and a whole heap of other things. So look, I think there's an opportunity here to look at this. I think Peary Street is lacking a lot in greening and in better um, footpath treatments and capital works. So there might be an opportunity to do that. And look, just through previous administration, we've managed to bring the whole traffic to a halt on Peary Street anyway with the pedestrian crossing. So we might as well look at options to consider uh, how we can facilitate better bike riding on that uh, on that specific strip, especially between um, Pulteney Street and King William. But also, look, it makes sense. There's a lot of buildings in the area, so potentially, if this may encourage people to ride into work, that's a that's a great outcome. And it also connects into the residential area in the western part of the city a lot better than the other track does. Um, so, look, early stages. Let's look at this, um, and I do commend uh, Councillor Donovan. Uh, for putting this forward um, and let's see where where things go but i think it's really important as a council that we have a clear message and i'm pretty certain tonight that hopefully we can all support this moving forward thank you deputy lord mayor councillor donovan would you like to sum up the good news here is that whichever street benefits and in this case Piri waymouth is going to get an amazing uptake so you know we know we know evidence shows us from around the world, that this is going to this is going to provide a boost to businesses on the street on on uh, Perry Way Mountain. This is going to um, support the safe movement of people through our streets, and that's what this is really about. It's looking at safe streets for people. It's looking at vibrant streets for people. We know from Frome that once installed, these bikeways actually are um, supported by those businesses around the area. We've had that feedback from users of Frome. We know that the uh, there has been 1,500 more trips along Frome since we've put in the separated bikeway. So all of those extra trips are benefiting the businesses in that area. We've had that feedback directly from businesses along there. So um, I think this is going to provide a great outcome and now we can move forward, get it happening, um, and provide an excellent outcome for our city users. Thank you. Members, those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Members, that takes us to item 11.7, Deputy Lord Mayor. Deputy Lord Mayor, I move uh, the motion 11.7 um, as printed, and I'll seek a second it. Thank you, Councillor Abraham today. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, uh, the motion is quite self explanatory, and I think if we do one thing in this council term and deliver on this, our ratepayers will be forever grateful for us. Uh, I think there's a real good opportunity here that over the next four years, if we're able to be successful in our endeavours of convincing the state government that the parklands, as they tell us, uh, they are for all South Australians, and that they can legislate for a very clear mandate around protection, activation, um, and also funding of parklands, I think that would be really important. Imagine we have the opportunity where, at the moment, our rate payers of $100 million in rates they are paying close to $18 million a year in maintenance of parklands. That is 18% of the rateable base. Imagine we can all go out to the next election telling our ratepayers 
that we've achieved a 10% reduction in your rifle base. Imagine we've got that opportunity. If the state government was to agree to go 50-50 with us on what I consider to be a state asset. Um, I think the opportunity here is really clear. I know I've heard it from many councillors in the past and I keep hearing it now. We seem to think that we own the parklands, control the parklands, and we run the parklands. I don't know where that notion is, because if I remind every councillor that's been in this chamber and the councillors that haven't been in this chamber before, under their watch, we've lost a lot of parklands to the state government. So it seems to me that the notions of custodians is not really true. We're the cleanest of parklands. That's what we are. So let's be let's be real and let's be honest about it. That's exactly what we do. We clean parklands as a council and we raise the parklands like our little children. And when the government's ready to come and take a child, they'll take it. We've seen that in Victoria Park. We've seen that in the Riverbank Precinct. We've seen that in Adelaide Oval. We've seen it everywhere. They take pristine parklands that we maintain, that our ratepayers pay for at all times. Um, and there is no contribution from anywhere else. And when we hear any language from the state government and from the wider South Australian community, it's always the language of the parklands is for all South Australians. So if the parkland is for South Australians and for all South Australians, why is it that only our 23 and a half thousand ratepayers are paying for it? Why is it? And I think that's a very important question that we need to ask as a council and how we engage with the state government in partnership to deliver better outcomes for the parklands. Because if they are serious about the protection of the parklands, if they are serious about the activation of the parkland, and protection and activation is a different thing, by the way. So protection doesn't mean leave them all bare and leave the trees as they are and don't touch anything. No, there is opportunities for us in many parts of the parklands to activate them in a way that will attract people to the city and come and live in the city, enjoy the city and work through it. Central Park in New York is a perfect example on how there's great opportunities in the parkland. I see the South parklands as the central park of that area, as residential buildings on Unley, on Unley side with Green Hill Road and also on South Terrace Club. So there's plenty of opportunities to talk about. And look, let's not completely um, dismiss what the state government's done. I mean, over the last few years, they haven't invested a significant amount of money in parklands with us, but they've been on projects. They haven't been on maintenance. So look, I'd ask members to please support this motion, and I really hope that in this term of council, we can deliver on this. Thank you. Councillor Abraham today. Councillor Moran. Look, I have a great sympathy with um, Councillor Abiyad's motion here, but I think me. at the core of it really is to um, spend, uh, to pass over the payment of the parklands to the state government. And uh, the old saying, you know, who pays the piper calls the tune. I know we're not very successfully um, calling the tune, but if they take over maintenance and care of the park lands, we've given away a, we've given away the park lands to the fox, really, and they can just say to us, we pay for them. Um, they're our park lands now. Um, the people of South Australia want us to build another stadium. They want us to annex this off and they want us to annex that. I think, I know what Sam is saying. I think we've got to be very, very careful. The one quiver in our bow is that we pay for it. And um, while, as I said, haven't been very successful using that quiver, we would be less successful if they paid and it would be their park lands not ours at all. Historically, the park plans belong to the people of Adelaide. Of course, we now know that we now accept that they're a, um, an asset for the whole of South Australia, but there is history behind our custodianship. Um, I think that they should uh, kick more into projects, but I really am very uncomfortable about them, the state government taking over the maintenance of the parkland. That is a huge job that we do. It's a huge part of our political life. And just as we lost the, the market, I don't want to lose the parklands. Um, we can certainly try to get them to tighten up the protections and try to keep a seat at the table because of our custodianship. But if they pay for it, everything, there is no need for us to be there and we would have lost all our vote. I will vote for this motion, um, but I, I think, warn you that that is a great danger and we put tread down this path very cautiously. It'd be lovely to say to our, um, our ratepayers here, we've saved you a bit of money, but what have we lost 
potentially lost for that saving. So as I said, I will vote for this motion, but I will, do not want to hand out parklands over lock, stock and barrel to the government because we know that they are the, the major trespasser on the parklands. Members, just as a point of order, when we're in the chamber, can we address each other the way we're supposed to be addressed through standing orders? That is, I am the Lord Mayor, the councillors are your fellow councillors, and the Deputy Lord Mayor is the Deputy Lord Mayor. We don't use first names and we will use proper titles. Thank you. I'll go to Councillor Sims. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, I um, uh, agree with um, Councillor Moran on this. I, I also will support the motion because I'm not going to say no to having a discussion with the, um, the government around um, getting them to chip in. However, I do have serious reservations about this. You know, I'm remembered, uh, reminded of the, the golden rule. Those with the gold make the rules. And um, if the state government are going to be chipping in and making a significant financial contribution, I'd like to know what they want in return. Um, and uh, I'm worried about that. So, you know, certainly um, I would impress upon you, uh, Lord Mayor and, and Deputy uh, Lord Mayor Abiad and um, the other councillors that represent us on the Capital City Committee to make it very clear to the government when you're having these conversations that whilst we welcome your input, we don't want to surrender control of the parklands um, and we don't want to um, lose the uh, responsibilities that are vested in us by state legislation, by the Parklands Act. Um, I, I take on board uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor's point about the fact that we're often stuck with some of the unglamorous work on the park lands, but we do have responsibilities vested in us under the City of Adelaide Act and under the Park Lands Act. And um, I would hate to see this used as a vehicle for some bracket creep and an opportunity for the state government to encroach on our territory, because I think that would be a really, really dangerous um, direction for us to go down. We have already, uh, in effect, handed over the membership of APLA, um, which is our own committee, and we no longer um, have a significant council representation on that authority. Um, I'd be really wary of us going down um, this path. And of course, a big responsibility will fall on Councillor Hyde, who is our sole representative on APLA, to make sure that um, he really pushes uh, parklands protection strongly on behalf of the community and um, the people that we represent. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Um, I'm also on APLA, so I think there'll be uh, uh, just just as a, a, a reminder. Um, I have Councillor Hyde next and then Councillor Marger. Yes, the presiding member, no less. Um, uh, but what an excellent segue. Uh, thank you, Councillor Sims, because I would like to take this opportunity to put on the record when we're talking about protection of the parklands, um, as some of you know, I'm a, a fervent and vehement supporter of the idea that we have a square metre in, square metre out rule with our parklands, that we don't see any further loss or alienation of what's already occurred. Um, and I believe we need that as a legislative protection. Um, so the Capital City Committee uh, is the exact place that we need to be having that discussion um, with the state government. And certainly I also do um, have concerns about what uh, the state government might want in return for their extra funding. Um, that they might be putting in or relieving us the burden of, of some of that. And, and certainly I, I agree with the Deputy Lord Mayor that it is an inequitable arrangement entirely at the moment for our ratepayers. Um, uh, but certainly if, if we have these discussions uh, at the same time around a funding activation and protection, um, and if we are successful and, and able to secure, um, and certainly it will take a bit of work, uh, legislative protection for the square meterage of the parklands as it is now, as I just described, meter in, meter out, um, uh, then I have no qualms with, uh, with allowing them to relieve us of, of some of the funding required to care for the parklands. So thank you for support the motion. Thank you. I have Councillor Martin and Councillor Kouros. Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I uh, I agree with uh, Anne, um, Councillor, may I call you Councillor Moran? You can call me Anne. Okay. I, I, I agree with Councillor Moran. Um, I think there is a danger in all of this and we need to be very careful about how it's approached. Um, the legislation is very clear. Um, if there is to be any change in the nature of the arrangements, um, then I would be greatly disturbed. Um, I, it is galling, however, it is galling that some 350 hectares of parklands uh, have already been excised 
uh, and given to what was the Riverbank Authority and what is now the Riverbank Entertainment Precinct Advisory uh, Committee, um, which may or may not have met since uh, I last heard. The CEO would be able to tell us no, it hasn't. Uh, and this body, uh, which is uh, uh, a, a body on which the Intercontinent Intercontinental Hotel is represented, the Adelaide Casino is represented, the Stadium Management Authority is represented, uh, and other organisations, uh, uh, some of which are private enterprise and some of which are not, um, affords us one vote, one vote only, on that 350 hectares. Uh, and yet, we maintain it, day in, day out. Uh, we repair it, uh, we furnish it, we make sure that it remains pristine and ready for the next proposal that Repack comes up with for the area. So, you know, that's a bit galling. Um, I, look, I support those words. I, I suspect um, uh, parklands protection has a different meaning to me than to everyone else uh, to have it proposed on an evening when uh, the very same speakers have refused to rule out the parklands for a helipad and at the same time have refused to consult people about whether or not we hand over a large chunk of it to the Adelaide Football Club <coughs> seems to me to be directly at odds with it. But let's hope that uh, when the government sees our words, they don't see the same meaning. Uh, I, I take it to mean to, uh, protection, uh, not the, uh, the, the handing over of large slabs for enterprises such as helipads. Councillor Kouros. I just have a question on what uh, Councillor Sims uh, was speaking to, but I just want to know how much control does the council have over the parklands? I mean, um, Councillor Sim says that we lose our control. What control specifically do we have over the parklands? CEO. Through you, Lord Mayor, we have we have control, care and control of the parklands as, a, right. as an entity, as an entity. Um, but there are certain parts of the parklands that have been. Um, assumed by the state government, which is largely in the Riverbank precinct. Right. Um, there is a map I can provide to council which identifies um, which parts are controlled by the state government. I'll circulate that to council. Right. Um, it, it is interesting to see the map and how it's been, um, I guess, allocated in, in previous years. So basically the state government has some control as well? They do, for right. certain parts so of it. So this motion would, seems to me quite fair to put it forward to the state government. That's correct. Uh, CEO, could can, you suggest? Can, a, uh, could I suggest you distribute a copy of the Parklands Act to the councillors? Happy to listen. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Councillor Kerrin. Thank you, Boris. Um, <laughs> Councillor Kerrin. All I wanted to say was uh, just to remind uh, councillors that uh, the uh, look the square in, square out, square metre in, square metre out thing. Um, let's be careful of that um, because. Uh, if you may recall, Rundle Road, uh, when the first plan for the uh, Oban uh, development was put forward by the last state government, um, there was going to be uh, the argument was that, well, don't worry, it's, it, it's, it's all like the, the, a huge sway, the even bigger sway of the parklands was going to be demolished as part of the original proposal. And the state government said to us, don't worry, because we're turning Rundle Road into parkland, so it's all OK, new view. Well, that was a garbage proposal. That was an absolute garbage proposal. You cannot take a road, put turf over the top and say it's returned to parklands. So just wanted to mention that. Be wary of that. Thank you, Councillor Kerr. And Councillor Haji had a question. Yeah, just I was wondering if the CEO could also circulate um, a map that shows all of the alienation of the parklands since their inception. That's what I intend to do, Councillor. Yes. Members, if not, I will go back to the Deputy Lord Mayor to sum up. Just say something quickly, um, Lord Mayor. It's very simple. The state governments, the parents, they make the rules. That's what we have an act. We take the act. We say thank you very much. We're allowed to go out till five, six o'clock at night, then we come back home and then they go, no, we're going to change the rules now. That's what they do. They give us the rules through the act. They make the decisions. And I really detest the fact that we think we're the only ones that care about parklands. We think as councillors, we're the only ones that care. We think the state government doesn't care. We think the rest of South Australians don't care. And we live in this bubble here, surrounded by parklands. We've never ventured out. It's like this movie that you're not allowed to cross to the other side of the parklands and see there's a world outside. These people also care. South Australia cares about parklands. 
They really do. They genuinely do. And we all have a different, we all have a different, every generation has a different explanation on what the parklands stand for, what should happen with the parklands. Every generation does. A generation of the past decided to build universities on them. A generation of the past decided to put a hotel on them and a convention centre on We have seen this happen on the peak. Different generations will have different meanings. I hope what we can do is to keep that value proposition for our city where we're surrounded, we're surrounded by parklands. I mean, look, for me, it would be an incredible vision for us to return all the parklands back over the roads and have tunnels on the parklands. There are things that we can achieve and the things we can't achieve. But this council, with the state government, if we're able to deliver on a saving for our ratepayers, give it five million a year, 10 million a year, 15 million, whatever it is, it will translate to significant savings for our ratepayers and we'll put a direct dollar back in their pocket. And this is what that looks for. And it looks for also that long-term protection and commitment from the state government that they are serious about the parklands and the value of the parklands, just as much as we are for the city that they are for the state. Members, those in favour? Those against, that is carried. That takes us to item 11.8, Deputy Lord Mayor, Central Market Arcade Development. Sorry, Councillor Knoll. Yeah, uh, there is uh, uh, in this motion a, a perceived uh, a conflict of interest, but uh, uh, I would, I would uh, have chosen to uh, stay and be possibly part of the debate and maybe add some value, but I won't be voting uh, for this motion. Okay, thank you. Or Councilor. in this motion. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Happy to move it. I look for a seconder. Second Councillor Hyde. Look, I'll be I'll be brief on this. Um, look, there's been a there's a significant um, uh, at the moment as to around that precinct, specifically around Central Market um, itself, and also Goodger Street and Grove Street. Uh, and I think it's really important uh, that we're able to um, go out and start engaging with all the stakeholders in the area, especially around a mitigation plan on how we manage. Uh, the development and give them the opportunity to respond through that process. So this is exactly what this is set out to do and I ask council members to support it. Councillor Hyde. Thank you, I reserve my right, but move the motion be put. Second. Council. <laughs> he seconded, sorry, you seconded the original motion, so. I second it. Okay, members, uh, we have a motion before you for the motion to be put, those in favour? Those against, the motion will be put. I will now put the motion. Those in favour? Those against, that is carried. Members, before you leave, item 12, uh, are there any motions without notice? None that I know of. Um, and that takes us to the closure. Councillor Sims has left the room, but he did get my award tonight for the worst pun. Um, we close the meeting, thank you.